Welcome everyone, I am Chris Gore. Today on a Friday, it's the Film Threat Livecast. Get ready. We're gonna be talking about The First Omen, Monkey Man, The People's Joker, along with a whole host of movies that are opening today. We will be reviewing them, plus a special look at a 1950s inspired AI generated Star Wars trailer. It just dropped in the last 24 hours. I think it's incredible and I can't wait to show it to you. Plus other little treats, hanging out with Alan Ng and I. Gonna be a good show today and I'm so glad you're with us. And we have a very special interview with the director of Space Command Redemption. This is a Kickstarter sci-fi film. This is the kind of indie movie I've been telling you is coming. And wait until you talk to Mark about how he did the effects. Doug Jones is in the project. Uh, other actors from Star Trek. Very exciting. That'll be at the end of the show when we do all of our interviews. Happy to have you with us. And I'm off to Vegas on Tuesday. Can't wait to see you all there. Why don't I just start the show? What am I waiting around for? Alan, where are... I, th 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 come on! <laughs> Where, okay, he's just not, he's usually around. Alan, 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 Al, Alan. Hey man, what's wow, going we on? Really are short. <laughs> We're really cramming a lot of stuff in today's show. Today's a big, today is a big show, which is why when we have a show like this, we do cut the clips. I understand not everybody watches the live stream. The clips cut right to the reviews. So uh, we appreciate those that watch with us live. Um, so thank you. A lot of our members and want to just say thank you to all the members. You get bonuses when you're a member. I'm posting all the Gord videos on there. Somehow I forgot to po post the inged videos. So no yeah, inging or no inging or goring today. Uh, but let's say hello to the folks in the chat. Thank you uh, to everyone watching both here and on Rumble. Uh, Slayer 96 DA the first for two says hail the gore and my Tyranator versus boom is done. Can't wait. Let us know about it. And not spelt Dylan for one nine nine says, so there you gore. <laughs> I like that. I like, I'm such a fan of dad jokes. Can I show you a dumb dad joke? I did. Uh, for those of you that do not follow me on my personal Alan and I there's the film threat social media which is film threat and everything and it's basically a feed of content that we do but Alan and I both have personal Twitter accounts and I'll just show you probably might be the dumbest dad joke of the year but I couldn't resist all the sweet baby ink stuff has been blowing up so I posted this said, I'm not even shocked anymore but it seems that Sweet Baby Inc. is now involved in retro games. Oh, I don't know. Not very diverse there. The paddles are black. Don't you notice it, Alan? Wow. And then some people didn't get the joke, and I had to explain the joke. I said, for those unfamiliar, here is the original <laughs> game. Oh, that's, that's the joke. Okay. That's the joke. Ah. Uh, okay. Well yeah. done, sir. Don't follow well. me on... Twitter, unless you like stupid dad jokes and occasional social commentary. And a shout out to the bad bandito. Remember the Frito bandito? First of all, when I was a kid, I loved Fritos and I loved the Frito bandito, which is probably now verboten because of current day. Yes. So uh, there you are. Let's get into it. A couple of things are happening right now. You know about Don Pulcino's animated series called Comic Shop. Okay. We don't need, we don't have a poster for this one, Alan. It's all good. All right. um, but uh, Comic Shop is a series that is done by uh, Dom Pulcino. He is a prominent animator, animation director in, you know, he's done Family Guy and The Simpsons and he's worked on Crapopolis and, King of the Hill, a lot of great animation as a director. He is a fan of not just the Film Threat show, 
but nerd Roddick, FNT, Geeks and Gamers, Critical Drinker, Jad Diversity, the whole crew. And that's great. He was so inspired. He has created an animated series. Now, I have not seen this. Normally, he'll share it with me early. I'm going to, um, I got to throw on my uh, headset here. And um, if you'll mute me, Alan, so I don't yeah. believe the audio. Um, let's take a look at a new video that dropped this morning at 9 a.m. There's another one that drops on Animation Vault at noon. And then another one that's going to drop during FNT. So three, it's like a three-part thing. And uh, I don't know. Why don't we just watch it and then subscribe to Dom at Animation Vault. Let's check it out here. Uh, and here we go. Make sure we got that. And... <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> this, what is going on? Okay. I know. It should have not another commercial. Walt Disney may be physically dead, but I think the Disney company is deader than Walt himself. I, uh, it was an accident. <laughs> well, there you go. That was it's it. Like, that, was... that was it. Okay, okay. So it's like it's like a DVD extra. Okay. He said it's like a it's like a DVD extra, but well, an actual episode dropping. There's an actual full episode. That was sort of like a thing he did just as a goof. Apparently, this whole one is, um, it, 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 this this one is basically all dedicated to doctor who oh. so, there you go um there you go yeah, well, so appropriate that i'm in that one what's that <laughs> so appropriate that i'm in that one yeah but hey we're gonna pivot to this portland 182b sent me this this morning you know i've talked about the ai inspired art that we're seeing i personally believe that at some point Someone's going to use AI to make something competitive to Hollywood. Now, at the risk of getting a copyright strike or whatever, a copyright, um, we're going to show this. It's uh, under two minutes. It is a 1950s inspired uh, retelling of, it's like a trailer for Star Wars, but from the 1950s. I'm going to share audio here. So we're going to watch this together because I really want people to know about this. This is what's coming. And if this is what we're able to do now, if this is what we're able to do now, think about it. Think about it. Think about where this is going to be in five years. Someone is going to make, someone is going to make a, a, a science fiction epic. It's going to be made on a low budget level and it's going to look like it costs $300 million. It's coming. So um, just a tease of this. It's uh, just a minute, about 90 seconds. So we're going to watch this together. And um, here we go. Alan, you ready? Yep. Got it. Let's here we it. go. Okay. In a, In a galaxy, galaxy far, far away, where the forces of light and darkness clash amidst the stars, a timeless saga unfolds. Behold the epic struggle between the noble Jedi Knights, guardians of peace and justice, and the sinister Sith Lords, masters of the dark side. Meet Luke Skywalker, a young farm boy destined for greatness. Princess Leia, a fearless leader of the Rebel Alliance. Han Solo, the charming rogue with a hairy sidekick. And Darth Vader, the Dark Lord of the Sith. From the desolate sands of Tatooine to the bustling streets of Coruscant, from the frozen wastelands of Hoth to the lush forests of Endor. Their adventures span the galaxy. But as the Rebel Alliance fights to free the galaxy from tyranny, they must face the might of the Empire and its fearsome army of stormtroopers. Yet, amidst the turmoil, hope flickers like a distant star as alliances are forged, friendships tested, and the fate of the galaxy hangs in the balance. Get ready for a journey beyond imagination where heroes rise, villains fall, and destinies are forged among the stars. Star Wars, a saga of epic proportions that will captivate audiences for generations to come. May the force be with you. Inshallah, today the idea is that we oh 
Okay. That was cool. amazing. That was pretty cool. That I actually just saw a, I just saw a video this morning on how they do that and, and the software they do, they use. Uh -huh. Um and it's not quite there yet. You can kind of see when uh when the characters kind of do exaggerated mo movements, uh it starts to distort, but uh that's pretty damn good. Well, look, we'll share the link in the description. Give a please, please give a sub to the channel. It's abandoned films and this is just it's just it's incredible. This just dropped in the last day. So, um, and I, 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 I don't know. I'm just like, is this the future? It's in, it's incredible right now. So it's yeah, it's it. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm super, super impressed with this. I can't wait to see more, but I'm look, it needs to be in the hands of artists in order for it to work. So there you go. Um, uh, let's see. We got movies to review. So we're going to jump right to them. Quick super chat here. We're going to grab from Benjamin for 10 says everyone from the East coast today. were tweeting about the earthquake they had to experience as West coast people. Can you tell them to relax? It's not that big of a deal. <laughs> Benjamin, uh, thank you for that. And you are correct. Um, I've been through a couple quakes Went through one in the early 90s, the Northridge quake. quake. You probably remember that, Alan, right? Yes. Oh, but do I remember that one? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it destroyed Anaheim Stadium. Yeah, I mean, it was it was crazy, crazy. So I remember getting up, grabbing my then young daughter, and just standing in the, they say you have to stand in an archway, uh, like mm -hmm. a door, because that's the safest place. So I stood there, held her, and we were just like, we got through it. And then there were aftershocks. Honestly, not a lot like happened to the place I was staying at, mm -hmm. which was off of Melrose. Um, but yeah, I remember it. So look, I, if you've never experienced it, it it's sort of like um, how Californians react to rain, which is like <laughs> unbelievable and kind of lame. But yeah, um, I'm looking at the number. It's a 4.6. That's nothing. I can do I a 4.6 in nothing. my sleep. I, I was miles from the epicenter of the Whittier earthquake in 1987, and it was a 6.1, and that was scary. Uh, wow. A 4.7 is nothing. Yeah. So, hey, well, let's get right to it. Alan, you have seen a film oh, that I, I Sorry, we, shouldn't, we should mention the meetup real quick. Uh, oh, right, yeah. Meetup. The, the meetup on, is Tuesday, April 9th at 7 p.m. at the Millennium Fandom Bar. There is a link to the RSVP in the description. Uh, we're very close to filling up. So please RSVP. Uh, uh, and I'll just say this. It's going to be like the pre-meetup for FNT. I know Ryan Kinnell is going to be there. Gary from Nerdrotic is going to be there. So if you were unable to get into the FNT uh, meetups on Wednesday and Thursday, come to Film Threat because they're going to be guest appearances from your favorite FNT po poop. Peeps, <laughs> I've only had a half a cup of coffee, folks. I'm yeah. almost there. I need a full cup. Uh, and uh, Alan... and hail to the almost 1,000 people watching us on YouTube and Rumble. Uh, hit that like button. Lick that like button. Hit that follow. Uh, thumbs up on Rumble. Uh, just whatever you can to support the channel. Smash the subscribe. All that. Uh, but Alan will be there. Dante. James from Verbal Riot, who's also a frequent guest on our show. Just people that you see on Film Threat, they're going to be there. So come to the Tuesday meetup. Link in the description. Let's go to our first review, which is going to be a movie I haven't seen. Alan, your pick. Uh, let's see. Hey, let's do Wicked Little Letters while I'm while it's fresh in my mind. Fantastic. All right. There you go. You like that? How's that oh, one? I love it. <laughs> All right. Let's do it. Alan, tell me about Wicked Little Letters, okay. which is a film I have not seen, but you have. Yeah. So Wicked Little Letters, uh, it, it appears that there's now a team up of actresses, uh, Olivia Coleman and Jesse Buckley. And in this case, they actually perform together on the screen and not play the same character. Um, what's happening here is uh, we're in the, about the 1920s, England. Um Olivia Coleman is a straight-laced, uh, right, proper Christian woman, and Jesse Buckley is a uh, is an Irish immigrant 
who likes to party and has the foulest mouth in, in town. And uh, one day, uh, a letter, actually, uh, a letter has been showing up at Edith, played by Olivia Coleman, her home, and uh, is just filled with obscenities. Uh, I believe I quoted one word here. Oh, yeah. In the letter, she is called a you foxy ass old whore. And uh, <laughs> do we just get to monetize now? Um, uh, and, and so she gets all these letters with all these obscenities. Her father and mother are, are uh, through the roof. And it must be uh, Ruby's character, played by Jesse Buckley, the next door neighbor, who is sending these letters. And so they go to the police and the police decide that, yes, it is Ruby. And uh, they arrest her for, for libel. And uh, weirdly enough, when uh, Ruby is sent off to prison uh, before trial, uh, the letters stop. But when she is uh, bailed out, uh, the letters start up again. So it, it must be her. And so uh, this whole movie is about who, who is sending these letters. Um, look, uh, w- this will be a quick review because uh, this, this movie is not made for us. Um, mm. it's, it's a very female, female, uh, centric, uh, movie, very, uh, pro feminist. Uh, basically all the women are good. All the men are bad or morons. Um, but one thing that really stuck out to me is you can see here, uh, in the corner here, um, I think, oh, it's Anjaya Vasan. Um, Ajana Hassan. Uh, she she plays the woman police officer. That's her official title. Uh, she kind of uh, is forbidden from investigating the crime, but uh, she decides to do so anyways. Um, but you notice that she is Indian here. Um, Jesse Buckley's boyfriend is black. Uh, the judge in the case is black. Uh, there's a good friend who's also black. Um, this is 1920s uh, England, and uh, what 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 fascinated me was in the 1920s uh england was so colorblind uh they they, it was so diverse it was so colorblind what happened how did it get so bad from 1920 to today um quite frankly this whole thing just stuck out in my mind because it's like this this doesn't seem like uh, it's accurate to the period and um you know and quite frankly uh they it's so colorblind that race is never called out so hey uh I guess England at one point lived in this utopian society. Um, It just threw me out of the film because, you know, all these castings were done for virtue signaling and Mm. it just kind of stares out and blares out to you. The story Mm. itself, I I guess, is fine. But again, it's it's one of those women, good men, bad type stories. Um, And I think the reason you're here uh, to watch this movie is to listen to Olivia Coleman and Jesse Buckley say the most phallus obscene things you could possibly imagine and, and to get uh, lectured and to get, get lectured. lectured. Yeah. Yeah. All yeah, right. So, I mean, yeah. So, so you can't I, recommend it. So you can't, can't recommend it. it. You know, I, I'm sure this has an audience of, uh, of for women who like mo- stories about women. And there you go. That's what this movie is. I, I call that, um, I, I call that, uh, the, uh, let's take a look at the borings and it's like that, that sort of like it's a certain era where the all the drama is like i just received a letter Ooh. yeah yeah, yeah. And, and you have Those all these laced, you have all these straight laced british people reading the letter and all these all these obscenities you know there there's your comedy that's the comedy there you go um yeah, yeah. no not for me uh pass yeah so I, I, everything you described look, is big, like i won't yeah. be seeing it I'll say I'm a big fan of Olivia Coleman and Jesse Buckley. Uh, yeah, you know, and they they work together in this one. They they play basically polar opposites, mm. um, but there's just so much uh, so much cringe and so much impossibility in this movie that it just takes you out. So there we go. All right. Wicked All little right. letters. All right, a couple of comments, and then we're going to review Monkey Man. Uh, two the two big films open today: Monkey Man and The First Omen. We're going to tell you about both of them. Um, so let me pivot Oops. here. Sorry, no, it's all good, man. Let's go to some quick comments here. I want to thank uh Bushin Ryu Cat uh for five says happy Friday. The cast of FT and Peeps here. You heard the New York NYC quake. We got 4.7 <laughs> and aftershock, maybe Emperor Ing call off the attack. Alan, wait a sec. Are you attacking New York City? Are yeah. you? Oh. I wouldn't say so. I don't know, Alan. I'm not sure that. Um, Honestly, but, if I were yes, to. Yes. I will he... rule you one day, Flash Gordon. 
Oh my god. <laughs> oh wow. Well, all it is prepare her for our pleasure. It's 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 Alan all it's been Alan all along. Yeah. He is Emperor Emperor Ing Ing the Merciless. Yes. I mean, I'm only warming up with a 4.7. Okay. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking for an excuse to use that graphic. So, um and also want to thank uh thank you Bush and Ryu Cat and Bush and Ryu Cat became a new member. It's okay to laugh also became a member and Jeffrey N Mc uh excuse me McMahon also became a member. We thank you for that. Um, and if you're a member, join us on Discord. You get access to our Discord. Continue the conversation about film. And additionally, we post members-only videos. New members, we're, we're due for a members live stream as mm -hmm. well. But the, the members videos are pretty fun. I post a lot of Q&As from events that, actually, you and I both post Q&As mm -hmm. for events that we go to with, with uh, filmmakers. There's, a, there's like two Q&As with Sydney Sweeney recently from immaculate so if you're a member check out the members only video there's a playlist there that you can access and a quick question from jimmy francis who's a member says alan can you add a link to where we can see the making of the ai video is it I one link yeah i have to go through my youtube history but uh i mean honestly uh, ai videos on youtube they're plentiful well ai how to's yeah it, there's, in fact, um, my old colleague at G4 TV has an entire channel called AI for Humans. Um, it's Gavin Purcell, who's uh, the original producer of Attack of the Show, and Kevin Pereira. And they talk about uh, AI tools and demonstrate them on the show. One of the best ones they did is they took two AIs and had them talk to each other and they just watched it. So um, if you can find the specific link, yeah, Alan, to post in the comments. It. But let's pivot now to talk about oh, Monkey okay. Man. We will get that to you, Jimmy. I actually just found it, so I'll, I'll cool, post cool. it. Cool, cool. Post yeah. it in the link in the private chat. We'll put it in the description. Jimmy, thank you for asking that question. I had the same question. Okay. Let's talk about Monkey Man. Monkey Man is directed and stars Dev Patel. And Deb Patel, of course, you've seen him from Newsroom. You saw him in Slumdog Millionaire. He was a kid. Um, he's also in a film called uh, Lion, which is based on a true story. Uh, probably the best thing that he's been in. One of the best things he's been in, Lion. Uh, Monkey Man is an action film. It's based on a legend about the... Um, I'm, I'm not going to pronounce it correctly, so I'm, I'm not even going to try. But a legend of an avenging monkey that uh, is kind of like India's version of Batman. Not, you know, and there's, and that's fine. Um, the film really, in terms of the action, aspires to be a John Wick in terms of it's like close combat and whatnot. And Dev is, uh, Dev's character, see, I don't even know if he has a name under the thing. It just says kid. It's called kid. Yeah, he's called the kid. He's called the kid. He, he, he discovers a corrupt police chief that is responsible for the death of his mother. And throughout the film, there are constant flashbacks to this tragedy, the tragedy involving his mom and him as a child being just horrified and traumatized by this event as anyone would be. And his goal is now to get the people that were responsible. So he poses as a, uh, like a, a waiter at this high end place. He'll do any job. He's just trying to infiltrate to get close enough to the people because his mind is all on vengeance. Um, and, and there are twists and turns in the stories. There's decent action in the beginning, really good action in, in, in like the beginning. And then the middle gets very slow where not a lot happens. And then there is a third act that is filled with action. Um, I'll say this. The thing that kept it going for me was Deb Patel. But I was a little disappointed with the action. The film aspires to be John Wick. It's not. any any sort. Of, and I'll say this. And the film also, 
isn't helped by the trailer. The trailer is so good. Like one of my favorite trailers I've seen in the last mm. for a long time in terms of an action movie I'd never heard of. The trailer is fantastic and the movie does not live up to the trailer. Specifically for a couple of reasons. One of the things that happens is um, whenever there's action, the screen is always shaking like this and like this. Uh, 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 and it's like a shake and it's a shake and it's shaking. It's like, it, it's, it's like, you'll see it. Like they took it and like, they just took the camera and went like this and it's actually jarring. It doesn't make the action better. You know, just let us see the action. Um, it's very cleverly directed. My understanding is that they ran out of money mm -hmm. in the middle of making the movie. So Dev Patel actually, just started shooting pieces of it on an iPhone. Yeah, you were you saw the movie yeah. with Southwest Allen. Yeah, and, and he was there yeah. talking about that. But yeah, he did run out of money, and that's where kind of that's where Jordan Peele came in. Uh, Jordan Peele came him. in and helped him. It's helped distributed him by Universal. I'm not going to say it's terrible. And then there's this whole thing. There's a controversy that's erupted online about um he was interviewed on the red carpet about um trans representation or something, and um. I didn't notice it. There is a character in the movie that is a man that is like a cross dresser and he wears makeup and like a dress and he has like done up nails. I didn't see it. I just saw it as like, yeah, oh, that's a cross dresser. I, this is the first time I'm hearing it. Yeah. So um, the movie doesn't overtly do that, but I also have a sneaking suspicion that Deb Patel, cause I've met him. He's super based. I think he's very based. But I also think he's smart. He's playing the Hollywood game. Okay. So while that part of the movie wasn't distracting, don't get don't get distracted and sidelined by the fact that um, he made these comments on red carpets. Red carpets, first of all, I've done a very few red carpets in my career. It is literally the scrubbing toilets of television journalism is doing a red carpet. Every time I did it, and I did it for like one of the Harry Potter movies, you know? So I've done like a bunch of different red carpets in my time while I was at G4, um, despise doing it every single time. It's all inconsequential, mindless questions. And it's only an opportunity for a, a celebrity to be asked something stupid and to respond with something stupid. Don't- You, you talked me out of doing it early on. <laughs> Yeah, even I was though, just like, even though we got one of our biggest gets on a red carpet. Yeah, didn't you interview you interviewed Steven Spielberg on the yes, red I carpet? Yes, I did. Yeah, I yeah, got I, three good questions in for him. And it's on the website if you look up Steven Spielberg. It's on filmthreat.com. But like just don't get distracted by these my, so, actors always say dumb things because journalists on red carpets are not very bright and they ask stupid questions. It's a character that is a cross-dresser and Do it you, just sort of do you know which one it is? Because I can't even think of who it was. I, I oh no, I, you didn't even notice it. That's how subtle. I, yeah, it is. it's a character where he's being healed in the temple. Uh huh. So he he gets hmm. in a fight and he's injured pretty yeah. severely. I and remember he, he that. He heals. Yeah. He goes through a healing process, and there is a character at the temple that basically wants to help him, and um, that character is a cross dresser. I didn't we're, care. We're up in arms about that. No, some people are. And like, it's, I, I don't know. I feel like Dev Patel was baited. The thing is, is here, here's what I'll just say. This isn't the reason that the movie isn't great. Mm -hmm. The movie isn't great because the middle act is way too slow. This would have been a great movie at 90 minutes. It needed to be tightened. And there are the, here are the, the flaws. Two, Running time too long. Mm -hmm. um, the flashbacks with him as a child, they're throughout the entire film. You really only needed it in the beginning and then maybe a callback at the end. The, you could have cut 90% of the flashbacks. We get it. His mother was killed. He's angry. He wants vengeance. I get it. I get it. You don't need to constantly show it. There's that. And the action is actually they take away from the action by having the camera shake too much. Didn't like that. Really didn't like it. So a, a mild recommend, I'd give it a six and a half out of 10, six, six and a half out of 10, um, because I like Deb Patel, but no going in there are flaws. 
and those are the flaws. Yeah. Alan, you did an early review. Has your mind yeah. changed? Yeah, I mean, you, you pretty much mirrored what I said. Uh, to yeah. me, it was it was all about pacing. It was the fact that it was decent action loaded up front. And to me, I, I thought that third act was amazing. Uh, the third really act is amazing. Third act, uh, third act and, is great. And then you have this. So so basically, you have a, a roller coaster with a long dip in the middle and then comes up at the end. Um, Perfect description. Yeah, it, it's... You know, if you can handle that, if, if you can not get bored midway through, uh, you're going to have an OK time uh, with this movie. And that's kind of how I felt. Um, again, I'll say I'll say it the same with uh, One Love, uh, the the uh, Bob Marley movie. Uh, the English accents are so heavy in this movie. I had a hard time understanding uh, a good 50 percent of the dialogue i did also i did also i would pref i would have preferred subtitles yeah the, the the indian the accent is so thick i can understand Deb patel i couldn't barely mm -hmm. understand other people yeah it's off it feels authentic which i appreciate it's, yeah because it's it, it's you know they're obviously not going for clarity in their english uh i think it's just the way that's how they speak english but um it's it's very uh, you know monotone and mumbly in a way Right and right. Uh, and so you know when I'm uh, first of all the, the chief the bad guy the chief I didn't realize he was the police chief until midway through the movie, uh, but I know they mentioned it many times before that, and and I just didn't catch it. Um, and uh, yeah, and you know it's the it's that middle act. But I, I will say this though, you know, having seen RRR and Jawan, uh, bingo. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I do I do appreciate the kind of I, I think Dev Patel takes a very American sensibility with with this with Monkey Man in terms of uh, how the action and how the shots are structured. I would definitely say that this movie looks more like a comic book than most comic book movies that we see. Right, right. Um, so there you go. Um, it's a mild recommend for me. But here yeah. I'll end with saying this. I am really interested to see what Dev Patel does next. Yeah, let, let me oh. let me speak to that for a second. Yeah, um, this is his first director uh, film he directed, and also he was kind of pushed into directing it because when he was shopping for directors, uh, they all told him that he should do it because he has the vision for it. And so this is, so it feels like this is his first time. I, I think he studied as best he could and made the movie. And I am I like you am interested in seeing what his next movie is going to be. Yeah, so, um, and I would actually recommend a different film that Dev Patel, he didn't direct it, but he starred in it. It's from 2016. It's called Lion. Really good film. Based on a true story, it's fantastic. He's so good in it. And then also, of course, The Green Knight. The thing is, Dev Patel, I, I just, I'm interested in him as an actor. I think he's mm -hmm. just really good. He has a presence. He is a star. I want to see what he does next. Mm -hmm. And and so don't hold this against him. It's not a it's not a dud. It's just not as good as the trailer. The, tra the actually yeah. the biggest thing against this movie was the trailer built up such an expectation that it doesn't it doesn't follow through. And and all the but, cool stuff in the trailers in the third act. Yeah, everything in the trailers in the third act. But um, mild recommend. Maybe check it out on streaming when it comes out. Let's go to your comments and questions here. Want to start with Benjamin for 10. Going to skip Monkey Man, terrible title. But I think Deb Patel is a very talented actor, and he deserves to be in better movies. Not every movie can be directed by Danny Boyle. True. And Andrew Cram gifted five Film Threat memberships. Thank you, Andrew. And Wally, I want to address this. Um, movie contains an anti-Christian line. Yes, it does. There is a line that's in like the first act of the film where they're about to get into a fight with the monkey man and another guy. Um, uh, a you know, UFC type fight. You know, like with a an UFC audience type crowd. mixed martial arts thing. Um, and, and he says, are there any closet Christians in the audience? And then people go, boo. We're going to talk about that on Monday. No. Monday's episode of Versus is all Christian YouTubers. We're going to talk about the first omen and Immaculate with Sydney Sweeney. And we're going to have Melanie Mack is going to be on the show. Um, uh, uh, Max Von Priestley, among uh, Lorena Creole, all Christian YouTubers talking about uh, uh, Christianity being used in as a, a means to tell a horror film. So we're going to talk about First Omen, Immaculate, and Christian horror in general, and why Christianity as a religion is pretty much the only religion that is somehow used as 
a, a way into a horror movie. Can you think of any other horror films? I can think of one Jewish horror film. <laughs> None others. It's verse, Monday's Versus is going to be insane. Probably get demonetized because Melanie Mack was going to talk about butter or something. <laughs> Join us on Monday for Versus. It's going to be a or, really or she'll show. use her words. He'll use her. It's fine. It's Melanie. <laughs> Janie Juni says people are not buying now. Dev Patel did not give a based answer. He said trans rep is all defining. Why do these magazine ruin movies for everyone? Um, it, it's it's I didn't notice it in the film. Here's what I say: for people in Hollywood who play the game, they know what to say to make the powers that be happy so they can keep making movies. And if you see the film, Alan and I have both seen the film. I don't think it really, it's just a cross-dressing dude. I don't yeah. see it as a trans thing. Which um, which has been in movies since the beginning of movies. Yeah, exactly. So sorry you're on the bottom and Alan keeps getting, should we switch? Um, Want Biscuits says, journalism sucks today because it's all access journalism, i.e. Yeah. they don't ask pressing questions so they contain their connections. I mean, they maintain their connections. Sports journalism might be the worst. Yeah. Let, let me let me just say, I, I think I mean, definitely the, w the way you described his response was the was the response of least resistance. Right. He, he was not going to get if he had responded in a base way, if that's how he really felt, mm -hmm. um, we'd be talking about it and people would be boycotting. You know, the the mob, uh, the woke mob would be boycotting this movie. Just and I, I think he said it to avoid that end and that he was more comfortable offending Christians. And, and the right versus the the woke left. Yeah, it's, you know, it's unfortunate, but I feel like it's like a trap. You know, when mm -hmm. when a, a filmmaker or a star gets baited into it and he's just like, well, I have to answer this way. Otherwise, I'm going to be called out as a as a bigot. Right. So mm -hmm. don't hold it against him. Don't hold it against him and watch his pre watch Lion and the Green Knight. So yeah, and, and now, then regarding the Christian, the, regarding the Christian line, I, I'm not exactly aware that uh, that Christians are welcomed in India like like other religions. So it was are. it was I it mean, was accurate. It was accurate to like how people would feel in India. And but the thing is, this my whole point is, it's the only religion you can openly mock yep. without without repercussions. I don't yeah, want to. I don't want to go down a rabbit hole with this. I want to do that on Monday when yeah. we have. It's going to be all Christians and someone. Everyone on the show is going to have thirty seconds to save me. So we'll see how that goes. We're gonna we're gonna play a game and see if I can be saved. <laughs> each each we're gonna put it time on the clock. Each one each person will have thirty seconds to try to save me. By the end of the show, I might be saved. Yeah. You never know. All right, pivoting here, let's talk about a film that I have seen that Alan has not. It's called A Cat's Life. Oh, exactly. A Cat's Life. Let's see the poster, Alan. There we go. It says, Small Cat, Big Adventure, A Cat's Life. This movie is actually playing in theaters, believe yeah. it or not. It is a French film that uh, I saw that was, it's dubbed, it's directed by. Guillaume Medjewski, which I'm sure I pronounced it incorrectly. So no, no, Ms. Ms. Peacock is giving us a thumbs up on that. Is she giving me a thumbs up? Okay, <laughs> it's, it's a, you just sort of slur it, and you get it. Yeah. So there's a young girl named Clemence. She is. Uh, she loves her parents, and they're going through an uh, an unfortunate divorce. Mm -hmm. And they have to leave the current home that they're in. She has this idyllic life. She loves her mom and dad. And she finds this little kid, this little tiny newborn kitten in the attic, which she names Lou. She has adventures with Lou. She plays with Lou. And the unfortunate you know, separation of her parents means they're going to have to leave the house. And in the process of getting ready to leave the house, she loses Lou in the backyard. And Lou has an adventure in the backyard and then in the woods. And it's all from like, it's not, it's sort of partially from the cat's point of view and the point of view of the young girl, Clements. And it's very fanciful. It's cute. It's also real. You know, you hear the parents 
um, talking about divorce and they're going to separate and they have an argument and then they talk to, so that stuff like kind of to be, to be, um, to be honest, like as I am a child of divorce and that kind of stuff got to me. I mean, that watching that was like not easy stuff to watch because they played it completely real, not like a kid's film. And then you see everything. The cat is sort of the thing that is healing her, this her relationship with this little cat. So if you like cute animal movies, you are going to love it. It's 90 minutes. Um, it's very cute. And uh, I am a, uh, okay, I'm going to come out and just say it. I'm a cat person. I'm a cat person. I like cats because they're low maintenance. They're kind of like, yeah, it's cool. It's chill. I'm going to sit here. I'm going to do my thing, whatever. Hey, I'd like to sit in your lap now. So I'm just going to do that without asking permission. I'm just going to sit in your lap. Um, so I'm a cat person. I like cats. And, and so I've had them like most of my life. I currently don't have a cat, but I really enjoyed this film. And frankly, because it's, because it takes the point of view of the young girl, who's got to be like maybe 11 years old ish, 11, 12. Um, because it takes her point of view and the cat's point of view, it kind of like switches. So you see like, well, how does the cat experience the world? Right? Like, and what's weird is the directing, I have to give them credit. The directing of the animals is really good because if you've ever tried to take a photo of a cat or than any other type of animal, you go to take a photo. The cat always goes like this. As soon as a cat knows you want to take a picture of it, it's, it's, you gotta, yeah. So they did this really interesting thing where they're actually telling story with this little cat, Lou, and then all the little brothers and sisters that were also born in the same litter. It's cute. It's, um, it's definitely kid friendly, but it, I'm not saying like as an adult, I think you can still enjoy it. So I recommend a cat's life. And I'll just say this, um, just if you like it, it doesn't mean you're a pussy. And thanks for putting that comment up there, <laughs> Alan. Uh, in any case, um, yeah, no, I re look, if you like cats, you're going to like the movie regardless. I've never, and it's the fact that it's playing in theaters, you can actually go to a theater and see this. And I, I would have almost preferred to see it in French with subtitles but it's a it's moderately for kids. it's for kids. Yeah. Yeah. So they did the dubbing and the dubbing's not dubbing is not that great. Cause you see the is voice. It, is it Pippi the long stockings quality dubbing? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so there you go. I give it a recommend, you know, it's like a six out of 10. It's it reminds not, me. Of, a, oh, I, and, I'm, oh, go ahead. Yeah. No, go ahead. Sorry. Alan. Okay. No, it reminds me of uh, those old Walt Disney nature videos where they yes! kind of force animals into a story at the same time, kind of showing you the environment. That's, That's exactly what, what this is. Like those old Disney. I used to love that on yeah. wonderful world of Disney. There'd be a short film about a frog and you actually see the world from the frog's perspective. Yeah. And it's like, or whatever animal it is, you see the point of view of the animal. That's what this story is. It's the point of view of the young girl and this kitten. And it's, it's, it's fanciful, and if you're a uh, if you're a cat lover, this movie's a ten. Um, for me, it's a six. It's like you know, it's for a very specific audience. <laughs> Let's go to your chat comments and questions here. Uh, Roiline Sausage Ball says, "Dogs wonderful. Cats are for simp's. Whatever." Solomon Thornton says, "I bet Alan gave it two paws up. Alan didn't see it. Alan's a dog person. I will. Although you should have reviewed Dog have, Man, yeah. Alan." I should have. I, I mean, I have both a dog and a cat, so. Well, there you go. See? Uh, Adel is 24 from Rumble says, Mon cher homme, moi, la grande adventure de la rue en French. How did I do, Miss P. Coffee? Thumbs uh, down. Thumbs up. <laughs> thumbs thumbs up. down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a Benjamin for five. My cat is literally on me right now, and we're both watching you guys from our bed. We're cuddling me out. Well, thank you, Benjamin. Yeah. See? Benjamin's a cat person. I just like cats because of their attitude. Okay. Cat's attitude is like, oh, you're home. That's cool. That's cool. Chill. All right. Yeah. Fine. That's pretty much like it. All right. Hey, how about some food? How about some food? Like, yeah. Like, I don't know. I just like cats demeanor. Cats are punk rock. So yeah. there you go. Um, all right. Now we're going to pivot to our next film. I think what we should do, Alan, is 
when we go to comments, take the poster down. Yeah, that's what I'm. That's we're we're I'm trying doing. something new out, and we hope you like it. We're just trying to make it so that if you just join the show, you know what we're talking about. So here we go. Um, I'm gonna. We have what other is? Did you see the beast or someone like you? I didn't see. I did see someone like you. I didn't see the beast though. Let's talk about that, and then we're gonna talk about the first omen. So someone like you, Alan, yeah. let that's all you. That's all me. Here we go. Someone like you. So, uh, yeah, this is uh, put out by Fathom Events, meaning you have a subscription to Regal or AMC. You're paying full price for this one. Um, <laughs> yeah. This is this is a Christian love story. And uh, I re soon realized that from the opening moments of this movie. Um it, uh, it starts off with a quote from C.S. Lewis, uh, basically uh, paraphrasing the four loves where uh, basically if to feel the, the fullest, uh, to feel love at its fullest means that pain is involved um, or hurt is involved. Uh, it's the story of uh, Dawson Gage, played by Jake Allen, and, um, and he's in love with this girl, uh, London Quinn. Um, but he, he's loved her from afar. He, he, after his parents' divorce, uh, London's family took him in. And over that time, uh, he felt he developed feelings for her. And uh, unfortunately, London didn't exactly reciprocate until she recently broke up with her boyfriend. And uh, so now the door is open. And uh, as, as the two are about to go out to get ice cream, London gets hit by a car and dies. What? Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And um, I, sh I should also mention that London's mother is uh, because of because of uh, during the birthing process, her kidneys were ruined and uh, she is currently in need of a kidney. And uh, London was the only person who had the match, the perfect match for her mother's kidney. And now she's dead. Um, but but uh, we find out that uh, London has a has a twin sister. How did this happen? Well, London was uh, made in a test tube uh, and there were two embryos and London was born and the other embryo was sent off to Nashville <laughs> for another couple. And so um, so Dawson goes out and decides that there needs to be closure uh, and that he needs to meet London's sister. And that's kind of where the story, uh, that's pretty much the direction of the story. It's, it's the story of the sister who then struggles with the fact that her parents didn't tell her about this, that, that she's not really their child, that her sister is not really her sister. And, uh, and so a lot of betrayal and she comes back and lives with London's family and, you know, she feels family in this case. And so it's kind of like that. It, it's, uh, um, <laughs> this is, uh, this is fairly typical when it comes to Christian stories. This is kind of like, uh, it's a very Christian story. Um, and and my I think my issue about the Christianity in it is that um, it it leans into it at the beginning and it kind of disappears midway through uh, until the end when she sings um, uh, it is well with my soul. Um, you know, it, it's like uh, if you're going to be a Christian movie, be a Christian movie, um, you know, start, you know, pray a little bit more, talk about God a little bit more. Uh, especially in this time of what family is and uh, and the betrayal and forgiveness, which ultimately it gets to. But, um, you know, it, I, uh, I I think as a movie, it was shot very well. The acting's very good. Uh, it's a beautiful film taking place uh, in Nashville and um, in North Carolina. Uh, but in terms of the story, you know, it, it falls into everything I've, all the problems I have with Christian Christian movies. Um, it's probably one of the better done ones, but you know, it's still, it's still there. It's, it's that lifetime um, that Hallmark channel type story. And, the, and that's what you have here. So, yeah, yeah. I'm, not a, I'm not against seeing a film like that, like um, uh, uh, ordinary angels with Alan yeah. Richson was, ve was very good. I, and, and I don't even know how you could, categorize that as a faith-based film mm -hmm. the lead character who's based on a real person goes to church that's yeah. it there isn't any religion being pushed it's just religion is a part of his life right. he tragically <laughs> loses his wife and then he takes his kids to church it's just that's those are people that exist in real life quite a few of them by the way 
the, so. th the thing about ordinary angel though is it the message is very christian in the sense of it's about a community coming together to help someone in need you right. know the idea of charity uh, you, you know it's you know today people just sit around waiting for the government to give them handouts back back when ordinary angel handed out uh, came out uh charity came from the church came from people right. who had who had surplus and gave it to those in need um this one is just uh you know it's about it's about a mother who gave up her child because they she had an extra embryo and uh you know and it becomes this is a fairly muddled love story and did i mention it was a love story okay it doesn't i mean i can tell from the poster it's a love story but yeah it just it's something about the movie i looked at it, i was just like no this is not for me yeah not but, for me personally but it i think it fits it 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 hits the wheelhouse of christian movies of which i'm not the biggest fan of well look i don't mind a, a you know what i i i am not um i grew up in a house where we did go to church went to catechism even if people know what catechism is you probably you, some of you may know it um so with the catholic church the church i went to is beautiful on woodward avenue and 12 mile it's like it's like i'm it's um, an incredible church that I, I used to go to as a kid. But uh, once my parents split, um, that just sort of fell out. But I it fell out of our habits. But I'll, I'll, I do consider myself, this is now a popular term. If you've never heard this called, cult, I consider myself culturally Christian, meaning all the holidays. I observe all the holidays. Um, when I get together with my family, we do, we do say a prayer bef before meals. So, and I actually like it. I like that we're like close knit family where we can like, you know, we say, we just want the best for everyone, right? In our family. So, uh, and you know, so it, it's been a part of my life, but I don't go to church every Sunday. I'm not like, I'm not super religious, but culturally Christian in that, like, I appreciate. And, and that's why it's concerning to me that there's so much anti um, being anti-Christian or saying things against people who are Christian is so, um, it seems like it's just okay. I don't like it. So, well, yeah, you yeah. know, we'll get it to on Monday, but that's, that's been going on since the beginning of time. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's probably you mean with the Romans and the lions. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 That's okay, a long so time. For the beginning of, uh, AD one, uh, it's been yeah. going on since then. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, look, I'm very spiritual. I'm very, very Christian. Uh, but I've had, I've had my, uh, my, my, uh, conflicts with the church. Let's just put it that way. That's, that's fair, kind of but, where I am. That's fair. But the thing that has bothered me is the, this is a Hollywood thing is the prejudice against people who happen to be religious, happen to be religious. So yeah. that's, um, you know, I, I, I've seen it like uh, my friend uh, Jeremy Kuhn. We had him on the show. Jeremy Kuhn is a filmmaker. He's his big movie he made, first movie of his career. He produced and edited Napoleon Dynamite. He's a Mormon. Um, he is married with family. He he is just a good guy. He did the movie A Disturbance in the Force, which is the documentary about the Star Wars holiday special. It's on our interviews channel so check it out jeremy also he's religious and um it's weird how people are so feel and em uh just emboldened to be prejudice against religious people mm -hmm. it's weird was well, that whole forgiveness thing that christians insist on <laughs> turning yeah. the other cheek <laughs> you know yeah uh so would you recommend someone like you i uh, you know if if you like faith films uh, and are into the uh, Hallmark style of them, uh, yeah. But you know, I I can't I can't recommend this movie. <laughs> All right, well, let's get ready. We're about to uh, about to talk about another faith film, The First Omen. But let's go to your comments <laughs> first. Here, um, and there we go. The layout. Uh, let's go to your comments, starting with Hassan Chavez. Are there any Asians in the movie, Alan? No. No, Dimension it takes place in North Carolina and Nashville. <laughs> Are there not a lot of okay? It's I, all good. No um, I can be totally 
lambasting those two cities, but uh, hey, our our friend Tom Seabird says also worth noting. Oddly, four point eight earthquake four uh, four eight is the eclipse. Yeah, the eclipse is happening when we're doing our versus live stream. Um, so there you go, Benjamin for ten. Hey, Benjamin, very generous today. Thank you, Chris. I'm like you and Richard Doc Dawkins, a cultural Christian. But why does it seem like it's fair game on Christians? I say one thing about uh, Jews and I'm done online. Yeah, but Christians all day, you can disparage Christians on the internet and no one says a word. But if you say anything about any other religion, you're a bigot. Why is there it, it, like, yeah. this is why I wanted to do this. This is why the first omen, this is why I wanted to bring together people who are um, active Christians in their lives I'm bringing them together on a live stream and we're going to talk about the first omen. So tune in on Monday for verses. Thank you for your generous super chat. Yeah. I mean, Outside I will say pivot, I've heard, I've heard Penn Jillette, a known atheist talk about this and he brings up what I bring up. It, it, Christians will just forgive you. And that's why it's so easy. Yeah. Okay. Alan, it's time to review the first omen. Did you have an opportunity to see it? I did not. I'll see it this weekend. It's going to be all wait. Sorry. Yeah. I'm going to let you do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Alan knows what he's doing. There we doing. go. I yeah. love it. It's only taken us two years to get here and I love it, <laughs> but thank you. Let's talk about the first omen. The first omen is now in theaters. And I'll say this. You're, if you're a fan of the omen series and I am, I loved the first omen movie from 1976. I saw it in the theater as a kid. It was one of the first R-rated movies that I saw, horror film. It scared the heck out of me as a kid. And it's, to me, one of the classic horror films that spawned a trilogy, you know, uh, beginning with The Omen. And the first Omen, excuse me, it's going to get confusing. The Omen movie from 1976 the first was directed, one. directed by Richard Donner. This, the director of Superman, the first omen, which is out now in theaters, is it's a direct prequel to the to the omen from 1976. So there you go. Um, it, it's 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 similar in terms of story to Immaculate. It's about a young woman in 1971, 1971, who comes to Italy to uh, become a nun and she's, she's welcomed and she has to go through, she obviously has to go through a ceremony to become part of the faith. And I'm, that's where I'm, I'm kind of um, a little lost on, on what the traditions are, but, um, but, uh, it, she she's going through the process, but she's kind of getting she's sowing her wild oats. One of the other one of the other um, nuns in the convent says, "Let's go out. Let's kind of have some fun, right?" And they go out and they go to like a bar and they're dancing with boys and maybe they have a couple drinks. So it's like they're sowing their wild oats, sort of a last hurrah before they you know um, dedicate their lives to the church and odd things begin to happen. Creepy things. I mean, there are some really good jump scares in the beginning. And what I loved about it, it is not only does it feel like it's set in 1971 because of the way the movie is shot. It's shot in a way there's no, this is a thing like, I don't like when you see a period film and they're using like, you know, a steady cam or like these glorious shots. This movie, it looks like they've got like, the camera moves around, but not, but in a way that would be, it looks like it was filmed in 1971. And, and I'm telling you by the way that the story is told, you know, the camera's on sticks and it, it just, it totally works. The tone of this thing is frightening. This movie is much better than I expected it to be. And what it's about, it's about the birth of Damien. It's about the birth of the son of the devil. And it is, and you see this church has gone through a process where they're, and, and, and this, this is in the first act of the movie, you figure this out. Um, so, but I'm not going to spoil, you know, the last half because there are some really amazing twists and it leads directly into the omen from 1970, uh, 
1976, or at least the first moments from that movie. But it's um, the reason that the, ch the church itself is involved in a conspiracy trying to bring forth the this this demon child and the reason they're doing it is because people are losing faith fewer and fewer people listen to their elders or respect the church the only reason to bring people back to religion is to bring forth the devil it, it, it on earth and it's such a and when you realize that it's actually the church themselves that's involved in bringing forth the devil, that's when just things go awry. So Margaret is the, the lead character played by Nell Tiger Free. Is that her name? Yeah. She's really good in this. I mean, her range as an actress is spectacular. And like the original Omen from 1976, what's great about this film is the tone it is so creepy and there are a few cheap jump scares in the beginning, but they're really well told. And then it is just horrific. And there are just like the other Omen films, shocking deaths. I'm not going to tell you about any of them, but there are deaths where you're like, Oh my God, like the kills in this movie are crazy. And if you're a fan of the original Omen series, this is right. You, you literally can watch the first Omen made in 2024. And you can watch the 1976 Omen and just watch the rest of the film. It's such a really good prequel. There are some nitpicks about it that I can't get into because they're spoilers. But I even already, I got in an argument with my buddy Jeff. And I was like, well, you could explain it this way, you know? Because we assume that all characters tell the truth. And I would say when there's a conspiracy, all the characters are not going to tell the truth. I was surprised how much I love this film. Um. I saw it with Dante and Dante James is actually going to be on our versus show on Monday. Dante is also, uh, uh, he, he's, he's, uh, he's a religious person or has been, um, he'll tell us on the show, but with he, history, with history uh, is a history. Yes. But yeah. he, he really also really loved it. There's some really good performances. Uh, the actor who plays Tywin Lannister is in this bill. Nye is also in it. He plays Cardinal Lawrence. Of course he does. <laughs> he plays a cardinal. What? Of course he does. <laughs> of course he does. But from the original kills to like the tone to like you're, I'm sitting in the theater and nothing is happening and I'm riveted. That really tells you. And you, you want me to see this movie? You need to see it, Alan. Uh, Here's the one thing I will say. I, I have, of course, you're going to have nitpicks. First of all, I'm not Catholic, so it's not like I relate a lot to it. Right, right. Yeah. But there is one big thing that bothered me about this movie that is present in the original 1976 Omen that isn't in this movie. And do you know what it is? The soundtrack. The by No, the soundtrack is great because it gets into the ending and like the music that you remember from the Omen. Uh -huh. And it's I'm getting chills thinking about it. As a kid, that movie is frightening yeah. because of the little kid that they cast and also that score. And the sort of low-key evil that's in it is, I'm just surprised how much I really loved this film. I did not expect to like it this much at all, not even close. But here's what's missing from it that I think would have actually made the movie scarier. That is in in at least the fir the original Omen from 1976 had this. You know what it is? Quotes from the Bible. What's missing in this movie is the Bible. And that's what made that's what made the 1976 Omen and the other Omen films so scary. What made those films scary is this is in the Bible. You can read all of this. This is all uh, supposed to happen. Uh, an evil is coming, right? It's interesting. And what made the, the 1976, as a kid watching The Omen, like, oh, my God, I remember, like, going through the Bible and finding passages that are, like, that talk about it, right? Like, and it that made it even more frightening, like, this is going to happen at some point. And evil is, gonna, is going to rise. And I felt if this movie had included more of the Bible and just leaned right into 
passages from the Bible, it actually would have made it even more scary. And I was, I was, that was the thing that like, because my memory of, of the original Omen movie, seeing that as a kid was, it was the Bible passages that made it so real and so frightening. And this movie doesn't do that. And, and that's my only, that's sort of a big nitpick for me. But having said that, this is, at least in terms of horror films of the year, it's, it's in my top three horror films of the year. I don't know that I have a top. I've seen <laughs> yeah. I think you've only seen three. So. Yeah, yeah. But like, this will be by the end of the year in the top horror films. Now, I don't know how you continue the series, but they actually leave kind of a loose end where this could continue as a series that runs in parallel to mm-hmm. the other Omen films. The, and, and the idea that it's a period piece is so good. They really nailed it. Like it felt like the original Omen movie. It just, they, they, they captured that tone so well. The theater that I was in was a bunch of critics. They all clapped at the end which is rare. That doesn't happen. And you could hear a pin drop. Some of the scenes are so quiet and you could hear a pin drop. Oh my God. Uh, I'm telling you, I was surprised how much I loved it as a horror film, probably, uh, you know, between an eight and nine out of 10 really. And I'll, I'll see it again. I'll see it again. I I, I will, I will tell you, uh, you know, it's no secret that I don't watch horror movies. Yeah, and I will say I will say uh, the the trailer that played on television for this movie and in theaters scared the hell out of me. And I think that's what started my path down not watching horror movies. <laughs> it's okay, Alan. I'll yeah. take up slack with the horror. Yeah, but I mean that the, the original trailer is, and then the music uh, behind it. It was like I can't, I I can't stand this. Well, you're gonna see it this weekend, so we can uh, talk about it Monday. But like, so. I, I just, I was, I'm so glad, like, there's something that came out of a major studio, you know, Fox, mm-hmm. that I could love. And, yeah. You mean this, Disney? <laughs> right. It's, well, whatever. It's, yeah. it's look, if you like this type of film, it's a very well done version of this type of film. And I'll say this. There was more, there were more than a few times that I looked away. Okay. Um, It's not super gory. There are a few scenes and some I, I i i am not ruining any of the any of the kills i'm just saying be prepared at some point you may look away from the screen so a, a strong recommend from me for the first omen if you like horror and if you like this type of film my only my only beef is i wanted bible quotes i wanted bible mm-hmm. quotes so well, th- that's the authenticity of all this. It, a- it adds, yeah. Let's go to your comments and questions here. Um, uh, so we're gonna pivot, and then we're gonna we got one more movie to review, and then we have a special guest joining us. Benjamin for five. Our president just had Easter Sunday, also be the Trans Day of Visibility. By the way, just saying, it seems a lot of people want to piss off Christians. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. all I'll say to that is, you know, there's an election coming up. So, so, yeah, so vote, go vote. So vote, yes. Um. So there you go. Uh, thank you, Benjamin. Appreciate that, Jericho Leon, member for twelve months. Thankful for you guys, inged and gored for life. <laughs> That's we don't have time today. That is going to keep going, keep happening. <laughs> inged and goring is going to happen. Yeah, as and long as you cre- keep misquoting movies. <laughs> oh my God. There's, I, you know what? I do it to myself. I do it to myself. <laughs> uh, wasn't Damien born from a jackal in the Omen? It says real reviews for two euros. Um, yes, I can't discuss Monday because I don't want to talk any spoilers now. So we will not talk spoilers. Um, so real reviews, please come back on Monday. Because it we do verses on Monday, the caveat is we can talk spoilers because you will have had the weekend to see the movie. So I am going to address that question on on uh, Monday. I will answer that because it's a big spoiler for the film and I cannot discuss it. Thank you, Real Reviews, for two euros. Uh, appreciate that. Um, 
Christopher Moonlight Productions, always appreciate you. Early South Park spoofing the omen still cracks me up. And CD Stein 69 says, growing up as Catholic and living close to the original real exorcist house in St. Louis, I've always been drawn to the religious horror trope. I think biblical aspect has always seemed more terrifying. I agree. Like when you include the Bible, it just makes it scary. It just makes it scarier. Yeah. I'm also Here, on Monday. I'm sorry, interested sorry, in go, the, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, on I'm Monday, sorry. I'm interested in the kind of the Catholic versus Protestant take on this as well. Yeah, I, 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 I can't wait. Have, oh, yeah. Here he is. MVP oh, yeah. Maxfield Vaughn Priestley will be on the show on Monday, along with our friend Aaron Sparrow, Lorena Creole, Melanie Mack, Alan Ng, Dante James. Um, every, everyone is uh well, I think everyone with the exception of yeah. of um Dante and our church going, but, but Dante and I both have, um, you know, backgrounds in going to church, I guess. Yep. Culturally Christian, but MVP Maxfield can't wait to talk to you about the first omen with y'all. Um, yeah. So Max see the first omen. And if you can also see immaculate with Sydney Sweeney, I'm not, I'm not telling everybody they have to see immaculate, but, um, the two movies are very similar um, and then, oh yeah, Odin, Odin is going to be on from Odin's men. He's, He's going to sure. join us a little right. later in the show. Oh, okay. MVP Maxfield Von Priestley subscribed to his channel. Odin might have some great takes as well. Here's the thing that Odin said. I refuse to see the movie <laughs> and he has a really good reason why. And I want to talk about religion as a subject for films. Why it, I, I, that's actually, I miss religion being sort of this basis for movies, there was like, it was a morality we could all agree upon. Whether you were practicing or not, it doesn't matter. It was like this place, like I watched the Ten Commandments um, uh, this past weekend, of course, good Easter, good time to watch it. And I just was reminded, first of all, how good Charlton Heston looks in basically a loincloth um, oiled up with baby oil and how much, uh, this is Charlton, uh, Please release my people from bondage. My well, people. he would always say bondage. And they tie him up. He's in. Get me out of this bondage. They, they mentioned bondage so much. It's sort of hysterical. But and then sort of the melodramatic. Oh, Moses, Moses, Moses. Remember Nefertiri? Well, yeah. And, all that and, and let's not forget that Ben-Hur is very much a Christian Easter yes. movie as well. I own both of those movies. Yeah. And if you've got, I got like the 4K of 10 commandments and there's like this introduction from the producer that, and, and they do an overture. I love when movies do overtures, but thank you, Max. See you Monday. Looking forward to it. Uh, uh, Jericho Leon, the critics clapped back when the antichrist was born. Of course. No, they didn't clap. <laughs> they clapped at the, they clapped at the end of the movie. But not like because the Antichrist <laughs> yeah, was born. It was because it was a. All of us. I don't movie. know. Maybe you saw it differently. That's. I was not excited from the trailer. I was not. I was just like, Ugh, do we really need this movie? It's very close. Imma Immaculate. Immaculate's ninety minutes. This is almost two hours. Um, but no, they clapped at the end of the film. Aaron Taylor asks Bill Nye or Bill Nye. Bill Nye, the British actor from. Uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy has been in a million movies. Yeah, not the science not, guy. Not the science guy. Not the science guy. The British actor. So there we go. Well, um, love let's actually. See. Let's let's give props to him for that. There you go. And um, was he born with rainbow hair? Says Hassan Chavez. No. <laughs> uh, yeah. And then Mike M C Wong. Okay, this is the weird thing with Charlton Heston. Mike MC Wong says, get me out of this bondage, you apes. Go back and watch Ten Commandments and Planet of the Apes. There's something about, like, Charlton Heston being thrown in a cage with a loincloth. He's forced to have sex with Nova. He's, like, there's all this, like, he's not just tied up. He's tied up in a weird way. We did, in, in an article in Film Threat Magazine from the 90s, I, oddly enough, I hired a dominatrix to review Planet of the Apes and talk about all the bondage imagery. So, um, and Davina Duckworth says, Bill Nye was in Underworld, 
with Kate Beckinsale. Yeah, I've always loved Bill Nye as an actor. I'll, I'll say this about so, Charles Destin, but you know, I saw Soylent Green not too long ago for the first time. Yeah. I knew the ending of Soylent Green, the iconic ending. And yeah. when I saw it for the first time, it still creeped me out. Yeah. Uh, Thomas Pickett says, Planet of the Apes, 1968, another great Jerry Goldsmith score. Um, Alan, I got to take a quick, uh, okay. I'll BRB. You go through the chat. I will be right yes. back. All right. So uh, let's we got go. one more movie to review. One more movie right. to review. All right. Uh, okay. So uh, C.D. Stein, 69, at St. Louis University, a Jesuit university, the priests hold a film viewing and lecture on movies on movies like The Omen and Exorcist, etc. Uh, they're always enlightening from my from my perspective. Um, yeah, you know, uh, I I got saved at a at a Baptist church, and I remember the uh, the pastor when he saw The Exorcist, he he bowed his head down and said the the poor priest, uh, and he commented on how that poor priest didn't have enough faith to take on the the demon there. Uh, let's see. Okay, from Womp Biscuit, who is responding to the nerd far away, misinterpretations of any holy text are uh, sacrilege, in my opinion, regardless of the intent, um, because they're never meant with good intentions. The deliberate ones have been destructive. Uh, I totally get what you're saying there. And I'm kind of, you know, I, I think I kind of go back and forth on that one, but uh, I do understand that. And we will probably get into that on Monday, especially when. Because I feel like that's Odin's take on it. Um, Ms. B. Coffee, you could star some stuff that would also help me. No, we're uh, ready. We're ready. Okay, we're there back. we go. Never mind. There we go. Okay, we got one more starred here. Um, did we get to this? Oh, okay, we're all good. Um, let's we're gonna pivot to our last film to review for today. Right. And then we are going to is it the we one have I'm an thinking? interview? And I'm excited for this interview. I'm very excited for this interview. So okay. um yes. <laughs> okay oh my god yeah i saw i saw half oh of no 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 this is okay this I, is I'm why saying, we need both. half of the this movie been all, all hands on deck review alan oh all hands on deck because oh, we have to talk about this movie, this movie. we this have movie. to talk about this movie alan <laughs> this is alan we're doing it yeah we're doing Sad it man. alan we're doing it we're talking I'm, about i'm just saying uh, up front i only saw half of the movie and there's there's a reason why <laughs> Well, we'll get into it. Let's yeah. talk about The People's Joker. What is The People's Joker? It is a feature-length film. Uh, it's directed by and starring Vera Drew, who is a trans person, a trans woman. And uh, Vera uh, directed, starred in this movie. It's autobiographical. So you see... Uh, the story of Vera as a young boy, then transitioning into a woman and is obsessed with the Joker and all things Batman. This movie was the point of some controversy, actually, when the, the film was supposed to premiere at a major film festival and then was and then was basically dropped because um there it was dropped because this a media conglomerate i'm saying a media conglomerate i'm pretty sure it was warner brothers sent a cease and desist um I, I don't know if this is true there's the controversy about it is it was supposed to be at the toronto international film festival in 2022 so this movie's been sitting on a shelf for a while uh it was it was because of this so-called um uh angry letter cease and desist the movie did not premiere at toronto uh but it is now available in commercial release it played actually at outfest in 2023 which is a gay film festival in los angeles so this is the history of this movie and let me just say while the story is sort of this the story is almost like this ADD thing where it's like back and forth between like the mom and their relationship and this young boy who becomes Vera drew version of the Joker. Um, and it's mixed with all this Batman imagery. So it's like a fantasy in this boy's head. 
this young boy's head who then transitions and becomes basically the trance joker. And I, I don't know why the WB felt compelled to shut this film down. It might have also been, it might have also been a way to promote the movie. Yeah. I have a theory though, but I'll let okay, you. we'll get into the theory. So the story is kind of bounces all over the place of like the the story of a young boy transitioning to become Vera Drew, who's the filmmaker of the film. So it's autobiographical. I don't want to say it's like a documentary, but it's like mm -hmm. it's autobiographical with bouncing between scenes and then this sort of mixture of this trance Joker. Now, the only reason we're even talking about this is because it tangentially. Uh, connects to uh, DC, Batman, the Joker, and characters from uh, Batman comic books. And the reason that this film got a lot of attention is not necessarily on the festival circuit, not necessarily because of the connection to Batman and whatnot, but because it's it's a trance coming of queer age story might be the best way to put it. Right, Alan? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And... It's a terrible movie. It'll, it might be on my list as one of the worst films of the year. And the reason is this. It's not because of the story itself. It's because of the way that the story is told. It seems like the entire movie was shot. Most of the movie is shot against a green screen. And you see like crowds or whatever. It looks so cheap. It looks like one of those asylum movies where they had no money and it's so like overly done with like digital effects and this it's trying to like impress with these effects, but it's the worst version of special effects you've ever seen. This reminds me of something that you might see on Tim and Eric. You ever see the Tim and Eric. Awesome. The, the Tim and Eric show was like, they'd bring on these people that they'd find on Craigslist that were just awful and untalented that's what this is. Now, it's not as if there isn't a good trans story that could be told. This one isn't it. The only person that could probably, the only people that could probably relate to this is possibly other trans persons. Mm -hmm. But, um, and of course, everyone's, you know, we're going to be called anti trans because of giving this movie a bad review. It's a trap because the movie is terrible. And, and if you don't believe me, watch the trailer. For this film, I might be able to find the trailer. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know if yeah, I want to play watch the trailer. It's not I'm not going to play the trailer, but watch it. It's on the Film Threat Trailers channel. I just want people to see it. You know, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I dislike this movie for many reasons that you didn't mention. Uh, I think we disliked it for different reasons. Maybe that's okay. Okay, so okay, but like my reasons are, it looks cheap. It's mm -hmm. super lecturing. I mean, can I go on checklist? I don't know. Do we, can we give like, did we review this on film threat yet? I don't think we have. Here, let, let me, let me we tell need you to get a review on film yeah. threat. That, let, let me, yeah, let me get my, for, are you going to write the review? Uh, I will probably have to, if I can, if, 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 uh, link expires if that screener, if that screener, cause I think we have one, one final view on that screener. So no, I'm no, but it expires that. today. Ah, uh, okay. You're going to finish okay. it, Alan. And I want to hear Just let review. me say, just let me okay, say, okay. okay. Right, so, go ahead, go ahead. So, uh, um, in terms of the cheap quality of it, I I'll say this: um, it's an indie film. Uh, that's what we do. We we uplift indie films. I didn't necessarily. I, I appreciated the innovative, 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 the innovation uh, of taking of using the green screen in this manner uh, to tell their story. Because look, if you want to get your movie made, you've got to make it yourself, and that's what these guys did. Uh, that's what Vera did. Sorry, these people did, uh, and uh, and uh, and I appreciate that. Uh, I'll I'll give you my theory on why it was uh, pulled from Toronto. Um, there are several animated scenes of the original Batman movies in this in this film. My guess is they did, they weren't originally animated, and that they were those scenes were in the movie. And I think that's why Warner Brothers pulled it because they didn't have the rights to to show those right. uh, those clips in right. the movie. And so they were all animated. Uh, there's a lot of animations movie. Uh, there are a lot of voices. Uh, Maria Bamford lends a voice. Scott Ackerman, speaking of uh, Adult Swim, there. Uh, Bob Odenkirk, Tim Heidecker. They're, they're all 
lending voices are appearing in this movie. So it's got some cred behind it. My biggest problem is uh, I don't know what it is about gay comedy, but it's not funny. And the thing that's that uh, led me to this this idea or this opinion is that uh, this this movie highlights UCB, Upright Citizens Brigade here in L.A., uh, as a lot of the inspiration for the comedy. And um, and and this movie reflects that. Uh, perfectly uh, this movie as a comedy is like going to a ucb show done by their students and not by the the professionals right um, because because this movie the comedy is all about uh vera drew the uh, the joker and the young joker just talking as if they're on stage coming up with witty it, things to say yes to constantly feels, it, comment on stuff and it is like the only people who find it funny is is Vera Drew and, and her, her co-star. Um, for the rest of us, you know, I've been to these long form improv shows, which is why I hate long form improv shows. And it's people standing on stage talking and trying to come up with funny things to say constantly all the time without even trying to develop some kind of story that the audience cares about. And that's why long form improv comedy is not popular amongst the pop, the masses. And this movie is that movie where it's just, it's for improvisers. Uh, this movie, uh, Dick's the musical exact same problem. Yes. Uh, I, I think even bros suffers from that problem. Yes. Which tells me, um, to the LGBT community out there, you really need to reconsider what you consider comedy or the comedy that you want to bring to the masses because uh -huh. this is not that comedy and it just reflects badly on your genre. And so I will it's, say that about this. Yes. And the, the thing is, is we're going to get to your chat comments and questions momentarily, but um, it got very good ratings from critics. And so when this happens, when you overpraise a say LGBTQ themed film, when you overpraise it and and say it's awesome, and then a mainstream audience goes to see it, and it's objectively a terrible movie, that further erodes not only trust in the critics, but gay mm -hmm. cinema in general. Just as a look, there are there are really great LGBTQ films. There, there are great ones that exist. I, and I don't even consider necessarily John Waters films to be gay films. He makes movies, comedies for everybody. And that is the problem with current day LGBTQ cinema is it only is looking to appeal to the, the intended audience, which is infinitesimal. It's small, narrow audience. And even that audience doesn't support these films. If you want to make a gay theme film, make it so that other people can actually relate to it. And I agree with you, Alan, about your take on it, about it being, mm -hmm. it feels like a one man show. By one man, I'm not. Yeah. That's not an insult. Well, it's like it's a, a it's a long form improv show. That's what it felt like. And it's just oh my god! Like there are layers of awful I haven't seen for years. And just to be clear, while we support and talk about indie film on this show, we're pretty clear about giving honest reviews. And in that sense, like just because something is indie, doesn't mean that it's that it's good. It just doesn't. It just doesn't. So there's. I mean, look. If you look at filmthreat.com, re there's reviews, three to five reviews daily is pretty normal on the average, mm -hmm. around three, five reviews on a big day. And when we're covering when we're covering film festivals, it can be up to 20 different reviews every day. Okay. So um, we try to filter. So when we're talking about this stuff on YouTube, we're, we're, we're telling you about the ones that we feel are the best or the ones that worth your attention and that you're able to see. The People's Joker is in theaters, okay? This yeah. movie has opened in theaters. And it has legit celebrities in it. Legit celebrities and names as part of it. And I don't... I mean, is this going to evolve into like a Rocky Horror Picture Show where people are going to be mocking it? That's the only way I could I justify seeing it in a theater. It's just so... It's just like... I, I, I Look, it, it does... it To me, it does not do the trans community any favors i'm sorry it doesn't it's a just a solidly bad work let, let me say this about the quality of the film in terms of the green screening and all that stuff um if it if the story was better 
uh, I wouldn't have minded as much. Uh, in fact, uh, in fact, uh, if you are a filmmaker who wants to make your first movie with no money, this is a good route to go. Yes. But again, the story itself, it doesn't lend itself to it. And therefore, you know, it just makes cheap look even more cheap. It look yeah exactly the cheap look of it because we've seen movies that kind of mm -hmm. have this kind of cheap look. We've yeah. seen indie movies that use that as hey, a hey, style. Yeah. And you realize that it's the, okay. And 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 also you realize it's a necessity sometimes. You just don't right. have the money. Money wise, yeah. Uh, you know, look, Bottoms was I think the last LGBT comedy that you and I both really loved. We really uh, loved it. it. Had nothing no. to do with it being LGBT, or it was basically a lesbian. Um, yeah, it was a lesbian uh, teen sex comedy, um, but but, but it, the jokes were there. The jokes, the jokes were, were there. It was corrupted. very well done, and it was funny, and it appealed to people who are not gay. I mean, look, I I feel like look, I I I don't care that this movie exists. It's fine, but know that it's a limited audience, and I I don't know is anybody gonna walk out of this movie and say that was awesome? I'm so glad I saw it. I think there's one person, Vera Drew. Let's go to your comments. So this this movie is for me. It's a zero out of ten on my <laughs> list for the worst of the year. It has nothing to do with it being a gay. It's just a bad movie. It's a bad movie. Alan, I'll give it a one. Uh, I, <laughs> You'll give it a so, one. So technically, I liked it infinitely more than you did. So, <laughs> all right, let's go to our comments here. Wait, sorry about that, Alan. Uh, let's go to our comments here and pivot. Um, starting with some super chats here. From Helios ending for two says no eggshells were broken in making of this review. Well, that's true. Benjamin, thank you for that. Benjamin says, uh, to be honest, I only watch on cinema with Tim Heidecker and Greg Turkington and film threat. When it comes to movie reviews, I give you guys five bags of popcorn. Isn't it the whole thing with Tim Heidecker and Greg Turkington? They, um, Give like like Tim gives every movie five bags of popcorn. I've watched it before. That show is hilarious. Mm -hmm. It's so good. Well, Tim is in this movie, so yeah. Uh, John Thomas for five says, "Please tell me you're going to review Boy Kills World and Bambi: The Reckoning." Hundred yeah. percent. I believe I'm going we, to a screening. Yeah. Going to a screening of Boy Kills World when I get back from Vegas. And I believe and we actually. Reckoning. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I I think I reviewed it already and. In the Film Thread interview channel, uh, I interview the director and producer of uh, Boy Kills World. So, we, yeah, so we already have a review of Boy Kills World on the website. You can read it. And an interview with the director on the channel. Bambi yeah. the Reckoning isn't out yet 100%. I love those kind of movies, by the way. So I'm not, like, against anything that's sort of cheesy and bad. Trish Page, thank you so much for 499. The Omen scared the poop out of me as a kid. The music. The paintings of his face, the Bible. So, okay, he's agreeing with me. Trish says, the Bible quotes did freak me out so much. Ugh, I can't see it. You need to go see this new one. Please, yeah. Trish, I implore you, go see the first Omen, especially if you're a fan of the original 1976 Omen. It's with Gregory Peck. Oh, my God, that movie's so... Now I really want, want to watch the Omen, the first one. Not the first omen. See, this is it's going to confuse people. The first omen? No, the the omen from 1976. <laughs> you could go, uh, you could do like a whole what's on first, who's on second. Yeah, I don't know who's on third. The, the first omen? No, the first omen. <laughs> no, the first omen. No, the first omen. That's what I'm talking about. The first omen. It's in theaters. No, the first omen. I've got the DVD. So the first omen comes after the first omen. <laughs> True. Trish, go see it and then come back and report on Monday. On Monday. I want to hear what you think. Judd Goswick says my pronouns are ha slash ha. That would have actually been a, a good name. post. If this is the problem with the LGBTQ films, none of them have a sense of humor about themselves. It's all about victimhood. That's mm -hmm. why bros is terrible. That's why the people's Joker is terrible. And that's why John Waters movies stand the test of time. I'm seeing pink flamingos at the Academy this weekend with John Waters in attendance. And I can not wait. Where is this? At the Academy Museum. When is that? Okay. It's 10 bucks on Saturday. You want to join me? 
Uh, what time? In the evening or? I think it's like seven, six. Okay. Seven. We'll talk after the stream. Yeah. We'll talk after the stream. Uh, hey, Sean Hu for seven forty-two. Regarding the Shadowversity cartoon from the beginning, are people generally aware of Bambi meets Godzilla? Well, I saw Bambi meets Godzilla in the movie theaters as a kid. It's a 16 millimeter movie. Mm -hmm. And it's also, it was part of the animation celebration, which I saw in a theater, which also had nudity. I love the animation celebration. Are you talking about the uh, sick and twisted spike and Mike's sick, sick and, and twisted. twisted. It's also part of sick and twisted. It's a short film that's turned up in many festivals. It, like the movie's like one minute long. It's hilarious, but um, I don't, if you're not, if you're aware of it, great. If you're not aware of it, still funny. It's on YouTube funny. and it's on YouTube. Look it up. Bambi meets Godzilla. Thank, thank you, Sean. Who Jericho Leon, who's a member goes on to say indie films will save movies just as indie and double a games will save the games industry. Mm -hmm. I believe that. Yeah. And our next guest uh, who's joining us shortly <laughs> fingers crossed joining us <laughs> shortly um uh we're going to talk about that um justice film says preachy movies like people's joker lack a sense of humor to make it engaging that's exactly I, my point no my my um, part my other point is ucb is not teaching comedians well uh and this is a reflection of that i mean i've i've tried long form improv from uh, many years ago and uh i just found it not funny and I, especially at the hands of amateurs and students like me yes yes so yeah. it, it to me it's about like it's really about um you know it's a sense of humor because the thing is this a sense of humor connects every if you if someone knows that you have a sense of humor about yourself that just um I, I don't know. It just, it's like, then, then it opens up a conversation. The problem is of late, the LGBT, nothing can be joked about when it comes mm -hmm. to the T. Not one thing can be joked about. Look at Dave Chappelle. Had, had Dave Chappelle not taken certain stands. Um, I don't know. I, I feel like he really does have empathy for people um, in the, you know, the community. And so it's really disheartening. Um, so there you go. Um, could you read a couple of these? I got to talk to someone. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, there's a good comment here. Um, from professor fear. Funny that the Christian films you reviewed is less preachy than the trans film you reviewed. I can tell you early on in my life, Christian films were very preachy and very on the nose. And, uh, I think that's what caused me to not like Christian movies. Um, the funny thing is like, if if you if you know Christian movies, you should know the movie A Thief in the Night. I know dozens of people who were saved from that movie, and when I saw it as a full grown adult, I'm like, "How in the world did you get saved from this movie?" Um, Jimmy Francis. The film got a theatrical run into Toronto, and top reviews from critics. Good example of why we'd we rather listen to film threat than most reviewers. Yeah, I think there is a lot. Of, there, there is a lot of pressure to like this movie, uh, for for just you know, it, it's that age old, uh, you know, if you say you didn't like it, you hate trans people. If you say you didn't like, it, you hate black people. Yeah, if you say that, right, you know, right. it's whatever people group, and uh, you know, you you have to, you have to garner that uh, that credibility as a reviewer to say, no, the movie is just bad. Uh, Bill S. Preston Esquire, the criticism of the People's Joker sounds a lot like the criticism of most Christian films. It just wasn't good. It took itself too seriously. Couldn't laugh at itself too preachy. All right. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll get I'll get to these yeah. now. I'm I'm back. I'm 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 communicating with the with our guest yeah. with our guest. I don't know why they're not here. Uh, from Rumble, BMO better sub supporter says, "Go woke and become the joke." <laughs> mm. That's true. And preachy movies like The People's Joker, lack of sense of humor to make it engaging, says Justice Film. I think I read that one, but but it's so it's so true. It's so like if 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 literally the gay community could laugh at itself and say and, and maybe admit some truths, I think that would go a long way towards bringing people together, and it would go a long way towards acceptance. 
Because I, I think I, I remember uh, Lady Ballers. I think you and I wanted to like oh. Lady Ball. Oh, I have some news about Lady Ballers. Uh huh. I have some news about Lady Ballers. Okay. So we have a Google AdSense account to be able to run certain types of ads on the Film Threat website. We keep getting flagged certain uh, pages of Film Threat. These are just individual pages that are things that are like this page is a problem and we don't want any of our ads to run on this page. You know what one of the pages is? Lady, lady Ballers. The Lady Ballers review. It is literally just a review of that movie. Because Google AdSense, we actually have an um a word uh, it, it's like a um a, a you know, a WordPress plugin so that it's uh, you can swear in reviews, but it'll take like the F word and make it F dash dash K or whatever. So you know what it is, but we're not actually typing swear words, right? Uh, in reviews. And that's fine because that's the Google AdSense rules. You already know what we're trying to say. But um, so so it is what it is. Um, but um, yeah, so yeah. it's... um. So that page got flagged. Oh that page God. got flagged. I so, hate to say I, I'm not surprised. <laughs> yeah, but there was there was nothing but a review of the film. Yeah, and you know, I mean, it may if at worst it was guilty of political satire. Yeah, yeah. So, but but we should be able to do that. We should be able to do that. So the fact that pages, and this is what I'll say. So a lot of the things we're being flagged for, and we're going to, did we talk about this comment? No. Oh, here okay. we go. Yeah. A couple quick, couple quick comments. We're going to get to our, our review or, or our interview in just a minute. We're getting set up here. Um, but as further evidence, mainstream critics are paid off. It has a 79 on Metacritic. Uh, so triple threat 305. I don't think they're paid off. I think they're afraid to say something bad about a movie yeah. that would make them a target of the community. Um, the name of the website and the YouTube channel is Film Threat, not Film Pussy. Okay? <laughs> I don't care. We're going to be honest. Bill S. Preston Esquire says, too hot for TV has become too hot for Google. That's right. And Nicholas Vargo, our last comment here. We're going to go to our special guest in just a minute. Can't wait. Nicholas Vargo says, hail Chris and Alan respect respectively disagree with Alan's assessment of wicked little letters. This movie had me howling with laughter when I saw it two weeks ago and I'm not even the target audience. Hey, fair point. I have watched some of those types of films like wicked little letters. Um, but it's just, I, I, they're not for me, but it doesn't mean that I can't actually enjoy it. Well, I think leaning leaning into equity like it does just uh, turn me off. Yeah, it, it took you, it takes you out of the movie because you know, you know, England wasn't like that in the 1920s. Right, right. So there you go. All right. Uh, let's get into it here. Let's talk about this. Or I don't know if you had a graphic or not. Oh. Um, Is that that was it? Okay, minute. got it. <laughs> We're no, I, I remember the picture. I remember the picture now. So it's all good. I, I thought you hey. went to something else. <laughs> uh, a film has come out. It's a film series called Space Command Redemption. This is an ambitious series that is inspired by Star Trek and even has some actors from Star Trek, including Doug Jones, as part of the series. You can see the trailer on the Film Threat Trailers channel. We have the filmmaker, Mark Scott Zickry, joining us today. Mark, thank you for joining us on the show. Congratulations on the film. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, it's really good to be here. So I'm here at uh, my own studio, Space Command Studios, with all the robots and spacesuits and all that stuff. And uh, couldn't be happier uh, to be where I am talking to you guys. Well, we want to get a little tour before you, before, you know, <laughs> before the end of, of the interview here. Sure. But this is an ambitious series where you have, you know, uh, name talent, the, the special effects, the quality of everything from the costuming to the sets. I mean, it is, it really is. You, you've gone all out. Oops, oh, we, and lost, we lost him. We lost Mark. We lost him. Here he's coming back. Yeah, he's coming back. Coming back. Here we go. 
It's all good, Mark. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Alan. Modern it's all age. good. Technical difficulties. It happens on the bridge. Um, <laughs> but this movie got a nine out of ten from our reviewer, yeah, uh, Bobby Lapierre. Thanks, Bobby. Was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Bobby, Bobby just and, and by the way, we just passed it on to him and said, You you may or may not like this, check it out, whatever. Uh, Bobby oh, we lost like him again. The, tends to like the uh uh yeah. Right. Here we go. We, we yeah. lost Mark. Okay. I'll let you do it, Alan. All right. There we go. Cool. Here we go. Hey, Mark, you're back. It's all good. Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so tell us how you put this project together. Obviously, you had something of a budget. You were able yes. to hire um, SAG actors from Trek. How did you get the funding? I know there was a, was there a Kickstarter and yes. then other private funds. So tell us about, <laughs> maybe not walk around the studio. Um the studios and the go. networks. Can you can you hear me? Can you see there me? We there we go. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe yeah. maybe like stop and stay in one place with good internet at this point. But yeah. tell us how you got the funding for the project. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, I I'd written for all the major studios and networks. You know, Star Trek Next Gen, DS Nine, Babylon Five, on and on. Wrote the Twilight Zone Companion. So I really knew the genre, and I um and I wanted to do a show that was inspiring, like the original Star Trek that inspired me. And uh, so rather than trusting the networks and the studios not to screw it up, I reached out to my fans with a crowdfunding campaign, Kickstarter. And uh, our first campaign, our target was $75,000 uh, to raise in two months. We raised that in three days and uh, kept wow. going and raised 221000 And then through a series of Kickstarter campaigns and selling investment shares for $7,500 each, mm -hmm. uh, I was able to raise $4 million. And with that, I've been shooting wow. two-hour stories that link together uh, to form a season of Space Command. So, uh, so it's a 12-hour season. So we're finishing hour six now. Space Command Redemption is the first two hours. And uh, my wife and I write and direct and produce it. And uh, I have my own studio full of spaceships and robots and all that stuff. Well, I, you know, I did fail to mention that previous to creating Space Command Redemption, you've written for all these shows. You know the space. What, what made yes. you take the leap that this is a, a, an important question I want to ask you have worked professionally in the industry for some of the yes. biggest sci-fi shows. Um, look up Mark, <laughs> Mark Zikri on, look him up on IMDb. What made you make the leap from that to making your own independent project? What was the thought, your thought process? Yeah, well, you know, it was that, um, I just wrote a book called green lighting yourself that talks about how people can do this. Um, you know, when I started in television back when I was in my early 20s, you needed a studio and a network to reach an audience of millions of people. And making any show, any movie, anything cost millions of dollars. It was impossible to do it on your own, uh, pretty much, you know, with very few exceptions. And so but now, you know, science fiction never predicted we would all have video cameras in our pockets. And so right. so now with the video cameras that we've got, with uh, the ability to edit on a Mac or a PC, with the Internet, with crowdfunding, you don't need a studio or a network to reach millions of people uh, with with high quality science fiction content. And uh, so I'd spent all these decades learning my craft, building my uh, my my basic my base of, of, of incredibly talented people and uh off we went you know i have a youtube channel called mr sci-fi and we just hit a hundred thousand subscribers and uh, it's had millions of hits and again you know science fiction is, is unique i think in the fact that the fans become the pros and they they maintain contacts with their fans so i i was just at WonderCon. And there were fans and there were, uh, you know, the, the stars of the science fiction shows and, and movies. And, you know, there's, it's not arrogant or exclusive the way Hollywood tends to be. And, uh, mm -hmm. and so I trusted, I trusted my fans. I trusted my audience. And uh, because I'm the same as them, essentially. And, uh, and then I reached out to all these actors I'd worked with or, or knew. Uh, you know, Robert Picardo and Mira Furlan and Bill Mooney and Doug Jones and James Hong and on and on. And... Uh, it's a dream come true. I mean, we're, we're shooting even now. We're continuing to shoot. And uh, I have three sound stages, and I'm at the top of the food chain. I don't need approval from anybody to, to make this. It's, it's total freedom. So the book is called Green Light Yourself. I, I Green, wasn't Green, aware of this. Yeah, it's called Green Lighting Yourself. And uh, it's from my publisher, Silman James, who also publishes The Twilight Zone Companion, you know, which I wrote when I was uh, in my 20s. And... Uh, it's just a step by step, you know, because I found that most of the books on how to make it in film and TV are, are 
outdated in their advice. They say, well, you need a great mm. script and then you need to get an agent and blah, 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 blah. Well, you don't need any of that. How many TV shows and movies have great scripts? Very few. And all you need to do is is pull together enough money to roll camera and uh, and off you go. You know, it's uh, it's it's not as hard as people think. So I wanted to write a book that walked people through how I did what I did and uh, kind of demystify this whole process. Well, uh, first of all, thank you so much for that. I wasn't aware of the green light yourself, but I think there is I think we're at the cusp of an indie film revolution. Yes. When you look at the quality of the effects in Space Command Redemption, which I'm actually going to show people the, uh, we and we will put the link in the description to the website. Cool. You can get all the information. There's merch. There's there's a way to contact you. Um, you can follow on Facebook. You can, there are links to where to get the film on, um, on Amazon. Um, it's all inspired by classic sci-fi. I yeah. would say while there's Star Trek, there's also a little Forbidden Planet in there. Yes, um, <laughs> deliberately. deliberately. Yeah, no, and it, it's yeah, it's I feel like there is going to be a big as the industry contracts, traditional Hollywood contracts. We are going to see more and more of people like yourself crossing over from professional having worked in the industry and written for Star Trek professionally, crossing over into making independent projects and yes. you you basically paved the path for doing it. We have a lot of questions from our audience, over sure. 500 people watching live. I want to get to their questions. Um, cool. But I feel like you're like, you're ahead of the game. We <laughs> did a story. We did a story um, actually this week on film threat about how some writers, professional writers in the writer's room. Okay. They're doing DoorDash now just to survive. Yeah. Wow. Jesus. Yeah. It's, it's terrible. It's in the Hollywood Reporter. These are like people who've been in the writers' room, like and like they're people that are writers' room writers are uh, contacting executive producer friends or or heads of shows, and they aren't working. The yeah. strike, I think, did no one any favors. I think it's very obvious, and and so I, I don't know. I just I really admire what you've done. We've got so many questions here. Sure, you bet. Let's you bet. Get right but, to it. But one but one thing I want to mention, Chris, before we go to the questions is. I, I really, you know, how independent film kind of rose to prominence in the 70s, uh, uh, an alternative to the studios. I think we're now entering an age of independent television where uh, where everything from how it's financed to how it... Nope. nope. He'll come back. Pesky internet. I know. <laughs> Freedom as novelists to, to, to essentially pull the trigger on, on, on making content. Um, that's my goal. Well, let's go to the questions. I'm going to answer this for you. Lord of the Films, where can we watch Space Command Redemption? The the URL is in the description of the show. It's spacecommand-theseries.com, spacecommand-theseries.com, or go on Amazon. Yeah, it's on, it. it's on Amazon for, for rental or purchase, and it's also on uh, Google Play at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, available multiple places and check out the website for even more resources and lots of fun stuff. Uh, so thank you for your question, Lord of the films from rumble question from eight Ellis 24 with the advances in AI, do you foresee it becoming easier for you to produce indie sci-fi stories? Possibly. But the problem of course, is that you take uh, the human Cre you, you basically remove a lot of VFX artists from the equation, and that's not necessarily a good thing. You know, con I, I work with concept artists, I work with VS VFX artists, I love the collaboration. And if you just have an AI, it might produce something that looks great, but I'm, I'm I don't know yet. I mean, it'll be easier, but it might not be better. And I and you know, so it's it's we'll see how it goes. But uh, I don't want it to take uh, creativity, human creativity, out of the out of the mix. Solomon Thornton has a question for you. Greetings, Sir Mark. I am a huge sci-fi nerd. Any advice for writing and directing sci-fi? Yes. Uh, first of all, don't let anything stop you. Be, be the drop of water that wears down the mountain. You know, it's, it's, it's the people that I've seen succeed are not the most talented necessarily. They're the most determined. They're the most, uh, they persevere. But if you want to speed your career up, uh, if you want to write novels, take go to the Clarion Writers Workshop. It's the leading science fiction writing workshop in the country. I highly recommend it. I'm a graduate graduate of Clarion. And uh, uh, and if you want to write TV and film, 
definitely uh, apply to all the TV uh, writing fellowships uh, that the networks have and the studios have. Uh, but more than anything, just decide who you want to learn from. Uh, I, you know, I wrote The Twilight Zone Companion to learn how to write and produce TV when I got out of college because there were no classes in it. And I thought, well, let's study one of the greatest TV shows ever made. And all of those, you know, I mean, George Clayton Johnson and Matheson and, uh, you know, Ted. It's all good. Nope. He'll, he'll be back. He'll be back. Yeah, he's come back. It really was invaluable because I was learning from the people, not the people who were theorizing about it, but the people who were actually doing it. And uh, and I was so I was writing for TV by the time I was 22 or 23. And I started writing The Twilight Zone Companion when I was 21. So I wow. was, uh, you know, so it don't, you don't have to wait until you're, you're, you know, 50 or 60. You know, you can you can be very fast out of the gate if you're if you're actually. OK. <laughs> He'll be, he'll be right back. <laughs> we all, it, it's all good. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, next question here. From Rumble, Adelis24 asks, outside of LA, where does Mark foresee the landscape of modern indie films landing in the future? Will everyone be on their own or will filmmakers localize around a new city like Nashville or Austin? Well, the fun part is um, that that it's the world now it's the entire world so for instance my development exec is based in london okay <laughs> it's all good folks <laughs> uh you know my vfx team are in germany and all over the place uh pakistan i mean it's it's the world and when i call them on on you know um whatsapp or or we have a zoom call it's like they're in the room you know so so you know and and when i have my actors come in to shoot space command I fly some of them in from Atlanta, some from New York. You know, it's, 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 it, I, you know, I, I don't think we, see the lovely thing, is, and, and also we were talking about VFX a moment ago. Some of my VFX artists are the people who designed Babylon 5 and won Emmys for Star Trek. But some of them are just hobbyists living in, you know, like somewhere like East McKeesport, Pennsylvania. So I'm, I'm totally open to who has the ability, the talent to work with us. I don't, you don't need to, I don't, I don't look at the resume, I look at the work. And if someone can make a spaceship fly in a, in a cool shot, well, you know, uh, come knocking at my door. It's markzikri at gmail.com if you want to build spacesuits or ray guns or, you know, or, or be a PA. I mean, we're very open to that. And uh, it, it takes thousands of people to make this stuff. But you can build that kind of team anywhere. All you have to do is do your uh, is bring your A game. You know, uh, right. a, a lot of the problem is, is that people people think that, you know, oh, unless I'm being paid millions, I, I, I'll just do a shitty job. And I bring my A game to everything I do. I, you know, I started in animation. I was writing for Smurfs and He-Man and Super Friends and Real Ghostbusters. And I brought the same work ethic, ethic to that. I brought as much creativity to that as I did to Star Trek The Next Generation or DS9 or any of the, the, the other shows. So it's, uh, you know, you, you don't, you don't, you don't, um, uh, you don't do a shitty job no matter what. You, you, you bring it up to the level you need it to be. And uh, that's, that, that, that's proven a great, great um, boon to my career, certainly. I'm looking at your credits on IMDb. This is crazy. The real Ghostbusters, like so many super friends. My, yeah. Oh, yeah. My, I mean, this is like He-Man, Incredible Hulk, animated, Smurfs. This, wow. Mark. Um, I didn't, yeah. I didn't know. I didn't know. I'm just saying I didn't know. Um, yeah. Other great it's been questions. Uh, the nerd far away asks, hail Mr. Zikri. Can actors green light themselves in a similar fashion? Interested yes. in taking a non-conventional approach here. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, you know, it, it, here's the trick of it. it uh, science fiction is a great genre to work in because you go to the conventions like Comic-Con or WonderCon with, Oh, well, he'll be back. I, He's back. Just from aliens and starship troopers and so forth. And they want to work. It, it, you know, you, you can pay a thousand dollars a day to an actor. It does. It's not going to cost millions of dollars. You know, obviously you're not going to get Tom Cruise, but you'll get some, you can put together three or four actors who are, who have a big fan following. And, uh, and, and that, that can pull together. You know, the, the real question with anything is, is what, what makes someone want to watch what you're making? Uh, and also, for instance, let's say you want to option uh, a short story from a famous science fiction writer. Well, the World Science Fiction Convention and the World Fantasy Convention are where the uh, writers go, the novelists. 
And so let's say you want to do a, a, a film based on a short story by George R. R. Martin or, you know, Kevin J. Anderson, who does the Dune books or whoever. And, you know, that you can you can option those things for not a lot of money, not novels. Novels are going to cost more money, but short stories won't. And uh, and that, again, gives you, hey, from the writer of the of Dune, from the writer of Game of Thrones, you know, it gives you something to hang your hat on. So it's basically building a team of people who already have the fan following. And uh, and that works tremendously well. You can do the same thing in other genres, too. But you just, you just need to meet people in person. Um, there's a writer named Brandon Sanderson who just raised $47 million on Kickstarter. And uh, I had lunch with him a few years ago. And he'd, he wrote 14 novels before he sold one, his first novel. And he would just like write them, send them as blind submissions and get rejected and put them in a drawer and write the next one. And But when I had lunch with him, he was one of the best-selling novelists in the world. And I said, what changed? And he said, I realized I was going to have to go out and meet people. And he started going to science fiction conventions and meeting the editors and the publishers face to face. And that changed everything because then it was personal and he wasn't just a name on a on a stack of similar manuscripts. So um, so I strongly believe in meeting people in person. Go where they are. You know, it's worth spending a few hundred bucks to to, you know, go to New York Comic Con or whatever, you know, and, uh, you know, and that's fine. That's fine. Did, and I don't know. Didn't we meet at Monster Palooza? Was it yes. Monster Palooza? That's where we met. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> He'll be back. It, it, and then, uh, and then you did a panel at, at I think um, San Diego Comic Con about independent distributors, and I actually, you know, followed your advice. You talked there too. Doing... Yes. Yes. And so again, you know, it's like I I went to you as an expert on on film distributors, and I followed your advice, and it worked. You know, so that that's a perfect example of my methodology. See, most people ask advice of people who don't know what they're talking about, you know, right. and, and then they follow that advice and it, it's a disaster. You know, it's sort of like if you're doing the same thing as everyone is doing, particularly everyone who's failing, you're going to fail too, you know. Right. And so you have to really be very, very um, scrupulous about has the, per has the person I'm talking to who's advising me actually su succeeded at what I'm asking them to advise me on, you know. <laughs> you know? And, right. uh, and that's super important. That's, that's why I wrote a book recently with Guillermo del Toro, because I wanted to learn from him. And, and you know, Rod Serling, I learned from Rod, and Ray Bradbury was another mentor. I mean, these are amazing, amazing men and, uh, and just phenomenal in, in what they've accomplished. Uh, just, it really is like a networking thing at the nerd conventions. And, and it's yes. like, people are so, people are so accessible. Yes. And there really is a spirit of, hey, I've done it. It's actually not hard. And, and yes. I can't tell you how many times I've run into people and I was, you know, the panel going to panels and just in the audience. Suddenly now I'm doing panels because I actually feel like I have something to contribute and yes. help people. So that, uh, couple, that's right. Couple, yes. A couple more questions here from Christopher Moonlight Productions. How do you market and sell your series in a way that reaches your fan base so you can bypass the distribution system? Yes, yes. Well, I started, um, first of all, I structured each story as two hours that connects to the other episodes and, and, um, and leads to a larger arcing story. So those, those can be split into one-hour episodes or two-hour films. And so that, first of all, helped me in terms of how I could sell it. Because, for instance, we're finishing the first season of the show, but we're already making the first two hours available. Um, wow. But beyond that, you know, I started my own YouTube channel because I, uh, I was having lunch with a friend of mine who was a uh, showrunner on Walking Dead, Glenn Mazzara. And uh, he, um, he said, you know so much about science fiction, you should have your own YouTube channel. And the cool thing about that was it cost no money. I mean, you can have your own network on YouTube for free and you can reach everyone in the world, basically. So I just started it and I really didn't promote it much. But it, it, as I said, it has millions of hits and and I just hit 100,000 subscribers. They, uh, YouTube just sent me a very nice award. And, uh, and, you know, and so that starts to gather a fan base. And once you have a fan base, um, you can, you know, reach out to them directly. You know, there's there's Kickstarter, there's Backers Kit, there's all sorts of things. And uh, and you try what works. And if it doesn't work, you say, well, who succeeded at this? Who can I have a conversation with? And the trick with getting advice from people who've succeeded is you don't ask for favors. You don't say, can you give me an agent? No, you, you ask for advice. You say, what have you done that has worked for you? That's all. Because, because most people are happy to share what works for them. They just don't want to be having to vouch for you when they don't know you. 
And uh, so, so essentially, you know, and, and, and another thing you have to figure out is how much money you need to make and how much money, like I keep my overhead low. My wife and I still live in a rent controlled apartment. We own our cars outright. I've, I've earned millions of dollars as a writer, but I keep my expenses low so that I can do things like space command and, you know, buy giant robots and, you know, spaceship <laughs> sets and all that stuff, you know, because one, one thing I do is I buy sets and costumes and props from big science fiction movies and TV shows when they close down because they can be bought for cents on the dollar and that can add production value to what we build fresh, you know, and so I've got stuff from Aliens and Prometheus and Armageddon and... Uh... Oh, <laughs> and there you go. We're gonna, you know, here, here yeah. he's back. Yeah, and nice. When, yeah, and when I was a producer at, on, at Universal on Sliders, uh, I asked if we could use all the sets and props and costumes from everything they'd ever made. And they said, no one has asked that us, asked us that question before, but we'll find out. And they came back and said, yeah, with a very few exceptions, yes. So we were using stuff from 12 Monkeys and Time Cop and <laughs> on and on, Jurassic Park. And that was because I learned that trick from what Rod Serling had done on Twilight Zone. So, and that's now what I'm doing with Space Command as well. Um, it's interesting. I'm the only writer who wrote for both Deep Space Nine and Babylon 5. And at the time, Deep Space Nine was costing... Uh, I think it was like three million an episode, and Babylon Five, with its initial pattern budget was seven hundred and five, seven hundred eighty-five thousand per episode. It never cracked a, a million dollars per episode. So I sat down with John Copeland, who was the producer on Babylon Five, because they were getting more effects, more uh, fight scenes, more alien makeups, more everything than DS9 was getting for like a third of the money. And I said, uh, "How do you do it?" And John told me, he said, "Most people will read, will read a script and say it can't be done." He said, I'll read a script and say, how can it be done? And that, yes. changes, that changes the paradigm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you, you just figure out a way to make stuff go. And, uh, you know, and if you can't shoot an entire movie, then shoot for a day or two. Start, you know, because if you have a day or two, that gives you footage that you can then use to build from. Because if you've got some cool scenes or some cool visual effects or something, then you can show that to people. And then they can say, hey, I want to be part of this. And it, and it builds from there. Yeah. Um, first of all, I just want to emphasize something you said earlier about just ask for advice. I get a lot of things where people come to me and they, they put the burden on me. Like, can you do this for me? You're right. right. I love helping people. Like, here's a phone number. Talk to this person. Here's an email. Talk to this person at this distributor. Yes. Here's the deal. Or I have a, 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 a little thing I send to people that ask for Kickstarter advice. If you contact yes. me at Film Threat, go to contact film, uh, go to the Film Threat website, Click on contact. I will send to your email a 14 page document about Kickstarter advice, like right. how to crowdfund. And I send it to people that ask for it. I love yeah. to help people because more people better. And as you were saying, also another thing you said that was great about the decentralization, you're working with people all over the world who are yeah. just fans and attracted to it. And also you gave out your email that yes. there you go. Yeah. And, and again, the, the reason is because I'm not afraid of people. I'm not afraid of the world. You know, I mean, it's really interesting because for a long time, I, people have access to my I, I give on my YouTube channel. I give out my email. I give out my phone number and no one's no one's misused it. No one is, you know, fuck, you know, screwed me over. And, uh, you know, it's I, it, it, you open yourself to the world and the world really can be very rewarding emotionally and, and in every other way. And, you know, and but also. Before Space Command, I had never raised money. I'd spent, you know, 30 mm. years writing for the networks and the studios. And, and so I didn't know if I would succeed. I just said, I'm willing to try. And, uh, but I also had, had people advising me and I had people sort of studying Kickstarter and seeing what worked and what didn't. And now, as I said, I have investors where um, we're going to be launching many Kickstarter campaigns moving forward. But we also have investors where I've sold, you know, investment shares in Space Command where they get a percentage of my producer's net profit for 7,500 bucks a share. So I have about 40 investors and that can be great too, because I needed something relating to space command the other day. And I called one of my investors and he, uh, I, I said, you don't have, I said to him, you don't have to say yes to this, but I need $30,000. And he said, it'll be in your account tomorrow. And it was, so, wow. <laughs> you know, wow. so that's how it works. But you have, to, but you have to, yeah. That's the other thing is ask. If you don't yes. ask, worst that can happen is a no, but if you yes. don't ask, nothing happens. That's right, but um, that, what that means is you have to be clear on what you want, because a lot of people... Ah, ah. He'll be back, he'll be back. <laughs> yeah. um, we're going to put all the links in the description they here. They, they don't get granular, they don't get specific, so specificity right. is what's needed.
-hmm. Now we've got your email address, uh, yeah. the link to the website. What is your YouTube channel so we can find it? We'll put a link my, there. My YouTube ch channel is Mr. Sci-Fi. So that's Mr. MR period and then Sci-Fi, S-C-I hyphen F-I, Mr. Sci-Fi. And uh, yeah, and and I, I post every few days. I And not just Space Command, I post about, you know, uh, Dune and and uh, everything science fiction, Constellation and, and guys, you, you, you name it, stop. you name it. Yes, I, I just subscribed. Yay. I just subscribed. Yeah, I just did. Oh, yeah. that's great! You got Let's... two more. Uh, just from this oh, time. here it is, <laughs> Mr. Sci-Fi. Look at that! <laughs> Subscribe for new videos. This is really helpful. We'll put. We'll also put the link to this in the description. Great. For this episode of the show. There you are. Great. All the links you got to pause the Jones. video. Here, the audio of the video is coming through. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry, Alan. Sorry about that. Yeah. Sorry. Um, last question we have for you. Sure. Is this from Rumble? Uh, BMO Better uh, says, uh, if you could cast Chris and Alan in a movie as the leads, what genre would it be and what would it be about? So, Alan and I, a a Alan and I, in a, in a show, it would be about these like amazing, incredible guys who spread joy and happiness wherever they go. And, <laughs> and, and it would be basically like I'd have them walking on water. You know, it's uh, I think I think I think anyone who opens up information and I mean, you know, we're all of us doing this from joy and passion. You know, it's like, yeah. you know, everyone thinks that Hollywood is a, is a bunch of, of, of creeps who are just cynical assholes. And there are those people, but there's also equal numbers of people who are doing it for passion and love, go home with their families who are as good as their word, who mean what they say, who are not backstabbers. And, you know, I, I created, um, 30 years ago, I created a round table of writers and directors and actors and producers, anyone above or below the line in film, TV, and books. And we meet every Thursday online and uh, in person. It's called The Table. And uh, we have thousands of members around the world now. And there's no cost. It's just come with a good heart. And and anyone can, you can be starting out in your career or you can have won Oscars. We have both. And, uh, um, you know, but again, it's treating one in, in, in the green lighting yourself book. I said the key to success as an artist is a mixture of confidence and humility. Confidence gets you where you're going. Humility allows you to learn along the way. So that's that's what I very much believe. Uh, I just want to say thank you, Mark, for being on the show. We have to have you back when the next have. episode comes out. And um, I know we talked about doing a watch party. Sure. So, yeah. So we're going to do a watch party for, you know, maybe a couple of the episodes because Great. I feel you're such a wealth of knowledge and you have a positive attitude. I feel like yes. you could go to a dark place. You can black pill on things. I'm a white pill guy. I'm like positivity. You can do it. It's all possible. And but you need like you need a lot of passion, like go for your dream. That's good. But yes. more than that, you need 90 percent is real information, how to get yes. things done. And you're one of those guys. Well, so yeah. I really admire everything that you're doing. Well, thank you, Chris. And, th and, and my, my hat's off to you guys, too. I mean, again, it's it's hard work, but it's joy. Every day is Christmas for me. And the one last thing I should say is that my wife, Elaine, I met her when I was 20. We've been together 48 years, married 46. She writes and directs and produces with me. She's the best part of every day. And uh, and she had faith in me when when no one else did. And and here we are now. So it's it's been a, a dream come true. Congratulations, Mark. Thank you again. Thank we will you. have you back and we'll put all the links in the description. Um, congratulations, your positivity. We need more of it. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Well, we'll I look Great. forward to talking to you next and thanks for everything you do. Take care. Appreciate Bye. it. Awesome. Bye. Take wow. care. Bye-bye. That wow. was, that was awesome. I, too bad about the technical problems, but that's okay. Yeah. Um, we didn't miss that much, but uh, you can't yeah. make a film in a vacuum. You, you've got to build that network. you got to you got to get out there, meet people, hire yeah. people, get hired by people. And, yeah. uh, and that's how you begin to succeed. Yeah. Uh, we're going to wrap it up today. I have some breaking news, folks. I'm going to be on FNT today. <laughs> I don't know why, but I am. Uh, someone was messaging me during the show. And uh, so I'll be back on a live stream yeah. sitting here. In make less sure you, than two hours. Make sure you eat beforehand. Yay, I'm going <laughs> to eat. So that wraps it up for us today. want to say thank you to our mods uh, who are there. Uh, uh, thank you to our Lord. mod, Lord Thoth. Thank you to Ms. P. Coffee. 
and Glenn Nuccio, our producer. And also a thank you to all of our new members today. M Torque became a YouTube member. So thank you for members. Check out the exclusive member videos. There's a lot of cool ones. So uh, appreciate you. And I'll see you on FNT. Alan, what do you got coming up this weekend? Oh, you're going to see the first Omen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. At some point. Hi, Dad. I miss you. We're oh, going to see X-Ray Girl in Vegas. She's going to be at, my, uh, at our party. Yeah. Like, it's going to be. Oh, my Lord. Oh, my God. Dad, help me. It's Vegas is going to be crazy. So uh, join Film Threat there. Link in the description. I got to go eat something. I'm going to be on FNT. Alan, anything else? I won't be on FNT, but uh, no, I'll be watching the first Omen and getting ready for a wild week next week. It's Monday's Versus is going to be amazing. Mm -hmm. I, I don't never heard of anyone doing it. All Christian YouTubers and some people that are that I've invited, I wasn't aware that they were Christian. Just like, oh, like it just came up in conversation. So it's going to be a lot of fun on Monday. Join us for verses. I, I was like, Terry Smith does uh, all Christian YouTube. So, well, uh, that's true. That's true. But she's not a, well, she covers movies not as aggressively yeah. as we do. But Absolutely. yeah. All right, Alan. Let's get out of here.